Welcome back, everyone. We are starting with session three. We request Dr. Y.V. B.K. Subramaniam and Dr. George Thomas to chair this session. Dr. George is the CEO of AgriGenome Labs Private Limited. He pursued his PhD in biochemistry from ISC and postdoctoral research from NIH. Among his many notable achievements is a paper in Nature during his PhD, where he reported the organization and bidirectional transcription of H2A, H2B, and H4 histone gene cluster in rice embryos. He has made significant contributions in plant biotechnology and application of next-gen technologies for crop improvement. Dr. YVBK Subramaniam is the senior application specialist at Canon Biomedical Incorporated, having done his PhD in biochemistry from Indian Institute of Science and his postdoctoral studies from University of Massachusetts Medical Co School. He has worked as a senior scientist in many R&D companies like Artesian Th Therapeutics, Gene Logic, Kyogen, etc., and as an associate director in Kyogen. Currently, he is involved in developing genotyping technologies for analysis of mutations in inherited genetic diseases and in pharmacogenomics. We request the chairs to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Neetu Gupta. And to be chairing this session, I thank the organizers for this. Um, I met Neetu this morning for the first time, so uh, nice to <laughs> meet her. Uh, Dr. Neetu did her PhD in IAC in Professor Subarau's lab, and I believe she worked on uh, Parthenium, as she was discussing this morning. Uh, after her PhD, she went on to do her uh, uh, postdoctoral research at NIH. Um, I also did at NIH, so it's something that we have in common, and uh, UCSF. Uh, she's an associate professor uh, of molecular biology in the Department of Inflammation and Immunity at the Lerner Research Institute, Cleveland, Ohio. Her lab is interested in understanding the molecular and spatial mechanisms underlying protective and pathogenic responses of B cells. She'll be talking today on systems biology analysis of protective and pathogenic B lymphocytes. Dr. Nina Gupta. It's such an honor to be here and such a great privilege to come back to the celebration of 100 years of the department where I did my PhD. Thank you so much Dr. Rangarajan and Dr. Um, D. N. Rao for organizing and um, having me join this session. I'll be a little bit of a fish out of water in this session because I think this is more of a biotechnology kind of um, uh, session but hopefully you'll see that we have some translational and clinical um, research projects too. Um, in my 20 minutes or so, I think I'm going to give you a little bit of my journey from here to, um, to Cleveland. Um, so there'll be a few snippets of things that people in my lab are doing, maybe um, one data slide per person in my lab. So you'll see how, how it goes. But I'm going to preface it by um, uh, telling you why I'm so interested in, in B lymphocytes. So why B cells? B cells, of course, are very unique because they protect us against uh, pathogens through antibodies. There's no other cell in the body that can make antibodies other than uh, in B cells. And these antibodies can uh, protect us against viruses, bacteria, uh, worms. Uh, they can also engage in um, uh, antibody dependent cytotoxicity when you have to kill, natural killer cells have to kill um, foreign or infected cells. Um, maybe I'm going to put it the other way. Hopefully it's going to be better now. Um, and so um, the, the other reason why uh, the antibodies are so important is because they are a hallmark of successful vaccine design. And in vaccines, you want long-lasting immunity. You want antibodies that are high affinity, so they latch on to the target and, and don't let go until they are uh, neutralized. And the antibodies have to be protective. Of course, this Y-shaped um, molecule is, is uh, signifying an antibody molecule. Um, and how, how B cells uh, protect us and how do they generate these um, antibodies is sort of depicted here um, a little bit. 
um, a naive B cell um, that is born in the bone marrow and comes out into circulation is surveying for antigen. And when it binds to the antigen, it undergoes um, clonal expansion. And um, in an anatomical location in your lymph nodes, which is what you feel swollen when you get the flu or you get some other uh, uh, cold or, or any other infection, in those lymph nodes, there are anatomical locations known as the germinal center. And the B cells migrate into this germinal center along with T cells. And this is where they undergo um, multiple rounds of expansion and somatic hypermutation, um, which leads to changes in um, the affinity of the B cell receptor. The specificity remains the same to the antigen, but the affinity changes. And this affinity can uh, become lower or higher. Our hope is that the higher affinity antibodies um, ultimately are going to be formed. These B cells with the uh, varying affinities are selected by recognizing limited amounts of antigen on follicular dendritic cells that are also present in the germinal center. And then the B cells are selected through engagement with T follicular helper cells. And now the B cells are sort of ready to adopt one of two fates. One is a memory B cell, which is extremely important for the, for the success of a vaccine, um, or an antibody secreting cell that can actually um, get rid of the, uh, the imminent uh, danger through secretion of these antibodies. So the B cell itself is never going to secrete that antibody. It's going to differentiate into an antibody secreting cell or a plasma cell, and that plasma cell is going to secrete the antibody, and um, those antibodies will neutralize the, uh, the targets. Now, all of this needs to be exquisitely regulated. Any um, changes in, for example, um, the B cell doesn't know how to stop dividing, or these antibodies are not actually targeting the antigen, um, which is foreign, if they're targeting self-antigen, or any other uh, sorts of alterations to this um, exquisite machinery can lead to um, dysregulated B cells. And if you don't have enough uh, antibody production, you can have immune deficiency. B cells can also incidentally make cytokines, and they can regulate inflammation. So changes in their cytokine uh, secretion behaviors can lead to inflammation. Um, if these cells don't know how to stop dividing, you can get B cell malignancies. If the antibodies target your own self antigen, such as DNA, you get um, scenarios of autoimmunity like, uh, like lupus. So it's super important to, um, to study B cells, I think. And it's, um, it's important to know what makes them kick and what regulates them. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of um, my journey. Um, I think that my journey started um, about 30 years ago right here on, on this campus in the old building, of course, uh, biochemistry department, when I joined the lab of um, uh, Dr. P. V. Subaral. Those, that's, that's a picture from his um, earlier days. And this is what he looks like. He sent me this picture uh, about a week ago when I talked to him um, uh, on the phone. Um, so I joined his lab um, as a batch of uh, 1990. So that's me right here. This is my, uh, my batch. Um, Ishtiak is, is here in, in the audience. Um, I, I, I thought I heard maybe uh, Kundu was going to be there, but I, I'm not sure um, if he's here or not. Um, so that, that's my group. And we, I joined this um, extremely fantastic group of uh, people. Um, this is Dr. Subarao, and then uh, there are other uh, sort of lab, lab members who were uh, a highly supportive group. And um, as everybody knows, um, PVS's P stands for parthenium, right? So everybody in his lab has had something to do with uh, the, the parthenium pollen. Um, and my goal was to um, study parthenium pollen and, and uh, purify the, the major allergens that um, lead to um, the allergic responses. I was here from 1990 to 95. The, the first uh, paper I published from his lab was um, to um, characterize the, the rapid and slowly releasing allergens from, from this pollen. Um, we looked at the major allergens, a 31 kilodalton protein and a 14 kilodalton protein. I actually went on to purify the, both the 31 and 14 kilodalton proteins. The 31 kilodalton was, uh, was called PAR-H1. And um, we characterized it as a hydroxyproline um, rich, arabinose rich glycoprotein. And the IgE binding activity of this protein was actually in its, um, the, the glyco portion of the, of the protein. Because when you, when you remove um, the, the, um, the glycosylation through pariodate treatment, you lost the IgE binding activity. Um, this work was published. And um, I was actually very happy to see um, 
the, the current science article that Dr. Rangarajan uh, uh, published uh, that he talked about this morning. Despite the constraints that he had in space, um, this, this work was actually uh, included here with certain carbohydrate containing Ig binding epitopes um, of extensins were identified as major allergens. Uh, so thank you for including uh, this in your, in your article. So I finished my, my, um, my training here and at this time I was looking for postdoctoral labs and because I had studied um, IgE binding, I was interested in antibodies and I was interested in how um, these antibodies are produced, right? So I had not actually studied B cells yet, but I was interested in studying B cells. I was interested in studying how B cells interact with T cells and um, provide the signal for uh, generation of these uh, IgE antibodies. So I wrote to a few people and um, one of the people who was um, interested was uh, Dr. Eric Long um, at the NIH. Um, and he said, well, I'm very interested in having you join my lab, except that I'm not doing anything with uh, antigen presentation and, and B cells anymore. I'm actually studying natural killer cells and signaling pathways. So while I was at IIC in the department, I used to run in the opposite direction whenever there was a signaling talk, because we used to have all these invited speakers. I was very intimidated by um, signaling networks and, and signal transduction. So that was a big dilemma for me. So he was willing to have me join his lab, but I had to study signaling. So I said, okay, I'm gonna bite the bullet, but um, I wanna study some kind of signaling where something to do with B cells is, is involved. So he said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll strike a deal there. So um, in December 1995, I w uh, went to the NIH to join his lab in, in Rockville, um, Maryland. Um, he was in the molecular and cellular immunology section, that's, that's Eric Long. Um, and what I ended up doing there was to, to do a deep dive, um, really dove in the deep end there, to learn signal transduction. And um, he, he was very patient. He, he taught me um, all the signaling pathways and I started by memorizing and then I started actually understanding and, 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 and really knowing how the signal is transmitted from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Um, and in the whole process, I didn't realize when I ended up um, comparing the negative signaling pathways of um, the killer cell inhibitory receptors on natural killer cells and the FC gamma R2 B receptor, which is a negative receptor on, on B cells. Um, and we showed that the two types of negative regulatory pathways uh, require distinct um, phosphatases. One requires a tyrosine phosphatase and the other requires a, a lipid phosphatase. I went on to help another postdoc in the lab in um, identifying which portion of the uh, of the, uh, the receptor, the killer inhibitory receptor on NK cells um, was important. Um, but I, I kept coming back to B cells. Um, so while I was in Eric's lab, even though he wasn't really doing much with, with B cells, um, I went on to look at um, the lipid phosphatase ship and I showed that um, this phosphatase can directly bind to um, the lipid kinase, PI3 kinase, in order to, um, to remove the phosphate group from PIP3, PIP3, um, which was the substrate for, for SHIP. And um, this was important for the FC gamma to be mediated inhibition of uh, B cell receptor signaling. Um, so while I was in the lab, I, I also sort of understood that it's not just sufficient to initiate signal transduction, it is actually even more important to, to curb that signal transduction so that you don't have runaway sort of activation. So negative regulation is important. That's something I, love, I learned from, um, from Eric. And I kept thinking about B cell receptor signaling. So um, I, I decided at this point, I had been in his lab for three years and I had not done much more with, uh, with B cells. I, I had learned a lot of signaling, but I wanted to still do something with B cells. And I wanted to see where the, the B cells are. So literally look at them. Um, so um, I decided to go to a B cell lab next and um, moved to, uh, to San Francisco to UCSF to Tony DeFranco's lab. And that's where I decided to take both a microscopic view through um, a Delta Vision uh, deconvolution microscope at B cells to see where B cell receptor signaling occurs and how it occurs, but also a 30,000 feet view of it. I wanted to see it as a whole. I wanted to see the B cells as a system. So um, that's why I say, you know, I wanted to see and I wanted to, um, to do some omics um, kind of studies. Um, that's Tony DeFranco, whose lab I was in. Um, and what we really showed here was that when naive B cells 
um, C antigen, they are, uh, there are these um, lipid, glycosphingolipid rich um, domains, cholesterol and glycosphingolipid rich membrane domains that end up, um, oop, sorry, it's too much in a hurry to move to, uh, to Cleveland. <laughs> um, So I showed um, through microscopy that these lipid uh, rich domains are uh, kind of scattered before uh, stimulation all over the surface, but then upon stimulation with the antigen, they coalesce um, at, at this um, one pole and that's sort of the, the cap of the, um, the, the lipid drafts. We showed that in this area, the B cell receptor um, localizes, co-localizes with this and tyrosine phosphorylated proteins, which are important signal transduction, are also localized um, in, in this B cell receptor um, and lipid draft rich um, region. Um, we published this work and then my next question was, well, what regulates lipid draft aggregation? Is this something that just occurs or is there a, a molecular regulation that's involved? Why are these drafts separate to begin with and what causes them to get together and, and coalesce um, at the end? And for that, I decided to, to use a lipid draft proteomics um, platform. I collaborated with uh, Rudy Eversold at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. Um, and Rudy had just uh, sort of pioneered a method which involved um, labeling um, proteins with uh, ICAT reagents. So you label a certain uh, uh, population of proteins with the uh, light uh, isotope and another with heavy isotope, then you mix it two and you do LCMS and you, you see uh, the relative abundance of, of proteins and, and, and peptides in, in the mix. So using this, um, this method, I um, identified uh, a protein. So a lot of proteins were actually associated with this lipid draft fraction uh, upon stimulation with, uh, with uh, of the B cell receptor, but there was one protein that caught my eye and that protein was Ezrin. Ezrin is a membrane cytoskeleton cross-linking protein. The N-terminus binds to um, the uh, transmembrane proteins or adapter proteins or PIP3 directly. Um, and the C-terminus binds to uh, filamentous actin. In that manner, it, it cross-links the membrane to the cytoskeleton. So it's like a molecular glue um, and um, serves to, to connect uh, the two. This protein left the lipid draft region, only a third of Ezrin was remaining in lipid drafts upon stimulation. But when you, and, and I validated this by doing a western blotting of lipid drafts and you see that um, Ezrin is kind of gone at, at this early time point of stimulation and then it comes back. And um, when you look at this microscopically, you see that um, this B cell receptor cap, Ezrin is sitting right underneath the B cell receptor cap. So Ezrin is, is um, back where, um, where uh, the, the B cell receptor was, uh, was coalescing and where the lipid drafts were coalescing. We um, made a, uh, a mutant of Ezrin, which wouldn't leave lipid drafts um, by, by targeting uh, the, uh, a mutation that would bind and, and lead the Ezrin to be in lipid drafts irreversibly. And we showed that uh, when you express uh, 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 the, the wild type version, the B cell receptor um, and, and lipid drafts coalesce, but when you express this mutant, the lipid drafts don't coalesce anymore. So basically the, the separation of Ezrin from lipid drafts was the signal induced by B cell receptor signaling to allow B cell receptors and lipid drafts to, to coalesce and for the signaling to, to start and to literally create a signaling platform where um, B cell receptors could become um, activated. So at this point, um, it was uh, uh, time for me to, to start thinking about my, uh, my own lab. And I bid farewell to, uh, to the DeFranco lab and I got a faculty position at the Cleveland Clinic in the Department of uh, Immunology where um, I was going to study more about Ezrin, more about negative uh, regulation. That's the DeFranco lab uh, at my farewell there. So I arrived at the, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic where I set up my lab in the um, Learner Research Institute, which is the basic science, uh, basic research division of the Cleveland Clinic, which has about um, 18 uh, different divisions. My lab is out here, looks out west, so I could still see um, UCSF all the way from, from the Midwest. Um, and, and in my lab, we have an interest which is totally focused on B cells um, in a variety of areas, but um, largely a systems analysis of um, how B cells are involved in regulating um, a response to infection, inflammation, uh, cancer, and autoimmunity. 
Um, we do discovery-based basic research, um, as well as um, more recently have started doing some translational and, and clinical research. And we use um, cell culture models, um, genetic mouse models, and, and patient specimens. So I actually hired my, my first postdoc, uh, Nita Parmeswaran, right here. She came to see me at ISC. I came here 12 years ago to give a talk at the biochemistry department. And she came up to, um, to, to meet me, and I hired her. Um, so she was my first postdoc, an outstanding um, uh, uh, scientist. And, and Devashish Pore, who was, who was the next one, the two of them together used uh, esden deficient mice that were targeted specifically to B cells. So the only cells in the body that wouldn't have esden would be the B cells. And using these mice, we uh, showed that uh, B cell receptor organization, um, the motility of the B cell receptors, um, which we imaged through super resolution imaging, um, the signaling uh, that was uh, downstream of B cell receptors, as well as the motility of the B cells themselves, was over all regulated by, um, by Ezrin. Um, we showed that the antibody production was regulated by Ezrin because when you had uh, Ezrin deficient mice, their antibody response was, was higher in, in magnitude. Um, we showed, uh, Devashit specifically showed that um, Ezrin could be targeted in diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, to, to reduce lymphoma growth. We also showed Ezrin deficient B cells um, make more IL-10 through the mid-88 independent pathway. And then we also showed that uh, when, you, when you target Ezrin in uh, a mouse model of autoimmunity, specifically lupus, you lose, um, you reduce significantly the autoantibody levels. So we, we really characterized the heck out of Ezrin in, 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 in B cells. And, um, but this was mostly in, um, in, in mature uh, B cell function, right? Um, I had a student who, a medical student who joined my lab, uh, Christina, and her question was, well, if B cell receptor signaling is important in B cell development and the generation of the wide repertoire of, of uh, B cell receptors, then why isn't Ezrin regulating B cell development and shouldn't it, um, regulate the B cell receptor repertoire. When the B cell receptors are being generated, uh, it's through a process known as VDJ recombination. The V genes, the D genes, and the J genes um, generate combinatorial diversity, and the ends of the V, D, and G genes, uh, J genes, um, display junctional diversity through deletions and, uh, and additions of nucleotides. So through that process, millions and millions of B cell receptors can be, can be generated, which is really important because there are millions and millions of, of pathogens that, that we may encounter. So her question was, um, is the B cell receptor repertoire affected by the, the deletion of Ezrin uh, in B cells? And so she, she took um, bone marrow cells and, and, um, uh, and mature uh, splenic B cells, and she performed um, sequencing to look at uh, the B cell receptor diversity. So she sequenced the B cell receptors. Um, and basically what she um, found was that if you look at the, the B cell precursors, the earliest point at which B cells become B cells, pro B cells, uh, the next stage pre B cells, and at these stages is where the RAG mediated recombination occurs, where diversity is being generated, and this is the mature B cell population. Um, each bubble here is representing um, a B cell clone, uh, a B cell receptor. Um, and the number and the frequency of these uh, uh, is, is actually uh, determining the, the size and the number of, the, uh, of, of these bubbles. Um, the number and frequency of the clonotypes actually equals diversity. So if you have fewer bubbles, there, is, there are fewer BCR, BCRs, the size of it actually tells you about the, the frequency. So um, you see clearly that the diversity increases across development. This is something that has been thought about. It's never been actually experimentally tested. So this is the first time that we're showing that um, there is an increase in diversity across development um, in B cells. But when you look at the Ezrin deficient uh, B cells, this is the control ones, you see actually that there is lower diversity at each stage of development. But in the mature B cell stage, it's equal. So it catches up. We are actually still um, looking at the mechanism of how this happens. So this is a snapshot of um, how Ezrin may impact the, the developing B cell receptor um, repertoire. I kind of came back uh, full circle from allergy to allergy because um, while I was here, I was characterizing uh, pollen allergens. But um, um, Elena, who is a technician in my lab, um, said, I want to study what B cells that don't have Ezrin do when um, they are when, when they are encountering um, an, an allergen. So we had a mouse model of um, house dust mite induced allergic asthma that she used. 
and she induced this asthma in the control and esrin deficient mice to see what happens to the inflammation and what happens to asthma, what happens to lung function. And what she found was that um, in esrin deficient mice, where the esrin is missing only in B cells, there is an increase in eosinophilia. So this was an eosinophilic model of allergic asthma. There is more um, eosinophils in the esrin deficient mice. Um, there's more IL-5, uh, which, which kind of goes hand in hand with eosinophils. Total IgE levels in, this, in the bal fluid, which is the bronchioalveolar lavage fluid, is more. And when you look at the respiratory function and um, airflow, you see that the esrin deficient uh, mice are stiffer, I mean the lungs are stiffer, and the, um, the amount of oxygen that they are able to, um, to, to force out is lower. So lung function is, is poor. So just by losing esrin in B cells, we've somehow um, created a chain of events that leads to greater inflammation and, and worse airway hyperresponsiveness, suggesting again that esrin is a negative regulator um, of, of these processes in, in B cells. Now we, we then hypothesize that esrin couldn't really function alone. We know that it binds to actin and it also binds to um, transmembrane proteins, but what about um, other proteins? So we, we decided to fish again and um, I'm not sure why this doesn't want to move forward. Um, so Ken uh, Matsui and, and Gospel Sonia in, in the lab, they decided to do a mass spectrometry uh, analysis and found that um, a, a protein, an unconventional myosin family protein myotinae was pulling down with, uh, with Ezrin. This is a protein that also binds to the conventional uh, myosin family protein myo2a. Um, we published this work and um, the two of them together uh, generated a B-cell specific myotinae um, knockout uh, mouse model to see how uh, myotinae may regulate B cell function. Um, and they sort of left the lab at this point and Mike Chung and, and Austin Proudfoot uh, took over. And m what Mike showed was that um, in, in um, even naive mice, there's more splenocytes, there's more so splenomegaly, there's more lymph node cells, there's more B cells, and there's already more germinal center B cells, suggesting that myotinae also was a negative regulator. When you didn't have myotinae, it um, affected the homeostasis of B cells. And when you infected these mice with the flu virus in, in, a, in a mouse model of flu, we found that there's more hemagglutinin specific B cells, more memory B cells being generated and more plasma cells that are being generated. So the immune response that the B cells are engaging in is also um, exacerbated in the absence of myotinae. When we let these mice age to about six to eight months, you see that there is higher IgG and this is of the IgG1 isotype. And we do an autoantigen array, we find that there's actually uh, an increase in uh, autoantibodies against a large variety of uh, autoantigens, not double standard DNA. So this is not a mouse model of lupus, but there's a l antibodies against a lot of other uh, antigens. So Austin actually created this picture to say that, you know, myotinae says not on my watch, I'm going to stop the, the, the autoimmunity. If you don't have myotinae, there will be autoimmunity. Um, and in the last two slides that I want to that I want to show you, I want to tell you that we have recently established a Cleveland Clinic Center of Excellence in Lymphoid uh, Malignancies Research. We call it Lympho Center. Uh, in short, I am directing this, uh, this center and my co-director is Brian Hill, who's a hematology uh, oncology practicing um, physician. And our goals are actually to study mechanisms of resistance and relapse in B and T cell lymphomas through genetic and epigenetic investigations, um, targeting esrin in lymphoma through medicinal chemistry and computational modeling and uh, understanding what the molecular and cellular basis are for um, success and failures in um, cellular immunotherapy, CAR T cell therapy, something that you must have heard of. Um, so um, we engage in translational and clinical research in, in this forum. Um, the first uh, data slide I want to show you is, um, was generated by Manish Patel, Feng Fei, and Ellen Kendall uh, in the lab. They were studying diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which we know 30%, 30 to 40, 50% patients are not cured, they undergo relapse. We heard about relapse earlier from uh, Graham Walker's uh, talk. And our questions were, is relapse associated with changes in DNA methylation, gene expression, or new mutations? We know that there are new mutations. We know that there are additional mutations in the same genes. There are changes in gene expression. I just want to show you DNA methylation here. Um, we compared biopsy samples from um, uh, patients who went on to get cured 
went on to get relapsed or their paired um, relapse specimens and performed epigenetic uh, analysis. And really, we were very surprised to see that from the time that the patient was diagnosed initially and to the time that they went on to get relapsed, there were zero changes in, in DNA methylation, no changes in DNA methylation, which was very surprising to us because we hypothesized that there would be changes. Um, on the other hand, there were a huge number of changes between the biopsies or tumor cells from the patients who went on to get cured or went on to get um, uh, relapsed. You can see from this uh, heat map here, the uh, DR and R are very similar, but the, the DC and, and DR uh, groups are super different. The last study is, is this multidimensional biomarker analysis uh, that we have done uh, to look at the response to CAR T cell therapy. CD19 CAR T cells are actually used for refractory relapsed TLBCL patients who failed our CHOP uh, treatment and at least two other kinds of uh, treatment. And the problems with this therapy are that there is still insufficient response rate is only about 40%. And there are adverse reactions such as neurotoxicity and cytokine release syndrome. So why is that? Can we improve that? And our idea was to, to do this multidimensional analysis by taking these patients and longitudinally collecting serum samples, um, saliva, plasma, PBMCs, et cetera, to look at a lot of different types of omics from here um, and ultimately correlate them with the response rate and adverse reactions. And the idea is to see whether we can make prediction models to um, enable patient selection, perhaps improve uh, the response through maybe better car design and to mitigate uh, or at least intervene um, in, the, in the toxicities. The, the only example that I'm gonna show you in, this, in my last slide is the, is the metabolomics. We collected plasma samples and we extracted uh, the metabolites, did mass spectrometry, acquired the data. We had mass to charge ratios, thousands of um, MZ uh, ratios. We performed um, a, a biomarker analysis with my collaborator, um, uh, Daniel Rotroff, and um, we focused on CAR T cell related encephalopathy syndrome or neurotoxicity, CRESS, um, and uh, to cut a very, very long uh, story short, uh, using this, this model, we looked at the day of apheresis, the day that the patient's cells are taken to engineer before they're infused back into the, into the patient. At that time, if you can say, whether this patient will have a certain type of neurotoxicity or not, that would be the better thing. So why put the patient through the, the process and have them lose their memory if they're actually not even gonna have a good response rate, right? So we looked at the day of apheresis metabolite abundance and we correlated that with um, uh, the, the CRESS, the incidence of CRESS. So it's a little bit of a retro um, kind of approach. And we found uh, at least two um, M by Z ratios with these putative IDs which separated if there was a greater metabolite abundance, that meant that there was uh, a lower risk of uh, CRES, but if there was um, uh, high, higher than median abundance, lower risk of CRES, and lower than median um, abundance, um, uh, higher risk of uh, CRES. So this and this are, are, are true. So I wanna thank uh, PV uh, Subarao for uh, initiating me on this uh, journey. Uh, the BC faculty, lab members, friends, Eric Long for teaching me negative regulation and really being patient with me as I learned signal transduction. Um, Tony DeFranco for uh, serving as a launching pad for me for developing my own ideas to, to start my own lab. Um, and then my collaborators at the Cleveland Clinic, my lab members who are outstanding, um, and my funding sources, patients and caregivers who actually um, help us with all the, the samples. Uh, my pillars of support, my parents who have been with my, in this journey with me um, forever and my husband and my son who continue to, to be with me. Thank you. Sorry to go over time. Thank you, Neetu, for that uh, exciting journey from uh, here to Cleveland. Uh, any question? OK, no question. Just test. In the Ezrin knockout mice, uh, are there differences in the Li1 B cells? Uh, no. I, no. Did you get a chance to take a look at them? We have looked at, we have done a characterization of all the different types of B cells, there's no. I think we are running out of time. Quick uh, question, please. Uh, very nice talk. My question was about your Ezrin knockout mice where you saw the B cell diversity come back at the mature B, st B cell stage. I was wondering from the sequence if you saw whether that was due to somatic hypermutations? Alone? 
in uh, germinal center cells. Okay. In the populations that we are looking at are naive B cells, so there is no somatic commutation okay. in those. We think that um, a lot of the B cell receptors or B cells that would have been deleted, mm -hmm. um, autoreactive maybe B cells, mm -hmm. are continuing to survive because the B cell receptor signaling is higher as we had already shown in the S in division cells. Mm -hmm. So those B cells that would otherwise be deleted are now hanging on. So mm -hmm. they kind of catch up, whereas the regular uh, B cells will die. So in those cells, the terminal transferase activity or the RAG activity, they're all normal? RAG activity is normal, expression is normal. Um, TDT, we are actually looking at right now to see whether P additions are altered or not. Okay. I think thank you very much. You can, uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk today um, on this uh, B cell uh, development. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar at this uh, time. Um, interestingly, Dr. Ravi Kumar and myself, we were batchmates in uh, 1979. And uh, uh, we also worked together um, at Astra Research Center. You know, we were colleagues. Um, and um, I'm really uh, very happy to see that, uh, you know, he is one of the first entrepreneur um, you know, basic biologist turned into, you know, entrepreneurial um, and started his first diagnostic company, probably in this country, uh, molecular and immunological aspects. So um, I have here some uh, very nice introduction. Uh, we are very immensely happy to have with us Dr. Ravi Kumar, CEO and founder of Exciton. Diagnostics. Dr. Ravi is a physician turned scientist after his PhD at our department. He was a scientist and group leader at Astra Research Center India again, uh, an institute founded in collaboration with biochemistry department. Um, that is one of the uh, efforts of the department towards you know basic science to application and drug development. Uh, Excite he. Um, turned a uh, technocrat, and I would call it entrepreneur, um, founded Exciton in 1993 under his excellent leadership. Exciton developed many immunodiagnostic products, first of which was a HIV diagnostic in collaboration with, again, a molecular biophysics unit in Indian Institute of Science. The company is currently engaged in developing systems for rapid detection of life-threatening infections, thereby allowing physicians to make critical therapeutic decisions. Dr. Rav Kumar. Yeah, uh, thanks to um, Rangarajan and D.N. Rao for inviting me to give this talk. And centenary celebration is a time to actually thank your teachers. I think I'm immensely indebted to Professor P. S. Shastri, who is no more with us. I would have loved him to see uh, an occasion like this. Um, I think the most important thing I remember is what he told me on the day I was leaving the department. He said, don't do bread and butter biochemistry. And I think I have avoided that so far, and I hope I can convince you that. The other person I learned a great deal is Professor Ram Sharma who told me that every morning you need to get up with a new hypothesis. He always came to the lab with a new hypothesis. And he was fully, I mean, he, he was jumping with enthusiasm every day. And that, I, I still pray that I need to have that. And of course, I lay, learned a lot from Professor G. Padmanabhan and Professor Poddar, from whom I learned a, a lot of uh, receptor kinetics. And of course, uh, that was aided by a tuition, private tuition I had with D.N. Rao. So I need to thank all these people and of course Professor Balram and a man who changed my course of life from neurobiology to infection, Professor S.K. Shankar, who was formerly director of NIMHANS, who worked with me on, um, on several projects. I think he is responsible, I thank him too. And how to do a goal-oriented research and start a company, I learned from Professor Anand Kumar, who is also in the audience somewhere, yes. Um, and, uh, Professor J. Ramachandran, who led Astra when I was working there. So now, um, let me directly go to um, the thing. 
We all get infections. Anywhere in the body you can get infections from the top to bottom, including brain to skin to various lungs. Of course, lungs is what all of us experience. You get an infection, you go to the doctor, doctor gives you an antibiotic. Quite often not determining what is causing this infection. 90% of us luckily get through. No problem. The 10% do not get well. This is the unfortunate lot. Out of them, there is about five, half of them have some comorbidities. That means they have other illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, or a cancer, some other thing overlapping, and they land up at the intensive care units. And that's where the problem starts. Now, once he comes here, because he has been given a prior antibiotic, the culture or determination of the pathogen becomes very, very difficult. Only 15% of them get any diagnosis on culture. Let's first talk about sepsis. I'll come to central nervous system infections, which I will probably stress more. This 15% is used as uh, in artificial intelligence uh, programs and also in making algorithms for a whole lot of sepsis. But there is something wrong with this 15%. Most of the cultures are the skin bacteria or they are hospital acquired infections. A patient comes into in with a com community acquired infection into the hospital. He acquires one from the hospital. The both exist. They, the culture cannot detect it. It will only detect the hospital acquired infection, which is slightly more resistant to many bacteria. Now, using this and projecting to the rest 85% is actually poor quality artificial intelligence data. But that's what is happening across the world. What we then, of course, what is the result of it? Result of it is a lot of escalation of antibiotics, people staying in the ICU for more than 21 days. Now we call them critically ill, chronically critically ill people. In fact, WHO now wants to make a category like that. And we have that problem. Though we have surviving sepsis guidelines and IDs, IDSA guidelines telling us we can use molecular diagnostics which are not dependent on culture. They're, they're telling us, but not much effort is going on. Anyway, now, in case of brain infections, somebody goes with a fever, and first it starts as a fever, they go to your doctor with cough or some other symptom, they get an antibiotic, third day, fourth day, they have a fit, or altered sensorium, and then they know it is a, it is a CNS infection, they are taken to a neurologist, he takes the cerebrospinal fluid and looks at it. Now the problem comes. Bacterial infections cause some type of re, um, cellular response. Viral infections cause another cellular response. The moment you give antibiotic, the whole thing gets confused. So when the patient comes here, with, after some time with an antibiotic, you start giving both antibiotics and antivirals. It's a pretty costly stuff. Number one. Number two, we don't know what is the outcome of it. Now, we have another situation. I thought just um, my son Kalyan is sitting, so I thought it is important to mention this. There is some, in leukemia cases, you actually wipe out all the white blood cells. You give drugs to wipe out. That means you are creating a nation without, without army and without police. That's the situation of the body at that time. And a whole lot of infections come and they kill patients. Because of that, the doctors are scared and they start very high-ended antibiotics and large prescriptions like this. And every time they get an episode of fever, all this is given quite often not knowing what is causing the illness. And this is another problem. Now, in all this what happens is we actually start with an antibiotic, then next day change it to something else which, which covers gram positives, third day probably resistant gram negatives and highly resistant gram negatives and probably give even antifungals and prescriptions of this kind are very common and then we call it a refractory case and we are trying our best and it is, it is at this stage that even the doctors start praying. Now, we have two kinds of resistance in the society. One coming in OPDs, we go and they give antibiotics. The lower level of antibiotics are all getting wiped out due to the um, due, due to this in increasing resistance in this pyramid of antibiotics. But in the ICU, we actually are burning the last resort antibiotics. 
we need a solution. That's what we said and we created what is called syndrome evaluation system, nothing but it's a simple multiplex PCR and hybridization based test which actually looks at 11 to 32 organisms in a single patient sample in a single test. That is the total of that. It can do a lot of things. We know that it reduces mortality. We have proved, I, I hope I can show you that. Makes diagnosis 10 times faster, detects four times more than all the conventional tests and facilitates targeted therapy and reduces antibiotic usage by 50 percent. Now let's look at, this is the whole technology. We call it hectoplex because there are more than 45 genes in some of the tests which are, we are simultaneously amplifying in a single tube. And no other multiplex in the world has this. All other multiplexes look at about five maximum genes in a single tube. And of course, we have after that hybridization, this needs no introduction and we have a lot of panels. Let's look at what did we do for central nervous system. For meningitis, we have about 17 bacteria and three fungi that we detect in one ml of CSF in seven hours time. We have also what is called acute encephalitic syndrome containing a whole lot of viruses of either Japanese encephalitis, dengue, West Nile, measles, mumps, rubella, whole lot of them, about 26 different organisms we detect again in a single sample to know what is causing encephalitis. Now encephalitis means the brain substance is reacting and there are fits or altered sensorium. Meningitis means the coverings of the brain are infected. The symptomatology is slightly different. We will come to that because it is important. Now simple, we, we for our sensitivity specificity we did not sweat much. We went to European Union and participated in external quality assessment program of European Union and we have very good sensitivity. We are rated top 2.5 percent of all the labs in Europe, 291 labs which participate in it. I think uh, that is not the issue and this is also the same thing. And we have now experience on 19,000 patients and 27 publications. Now this is the kind of number where we have a good knowledge we can actually start applying AI and come to certain conclusions. That is what we did. Uh, anyway, the further we have actually shown the, this is at NIMHANS, we have done a study in which we found, sorry, um, we found that our sensitivity is 77 percent to 96 percent, varies depending on the type of samples and 100 percent specificity. And this is verified against a battery of 41 tests, including microscopy here, cultures, in sing, single PCRs, then um, IgM capture analyzers for viruses, viral cultures and the viral PCRs. It's compared with that. That's where the percentage uh, sensitivity is come. Now, when compared to the, that algorithm of 41 tests, we are 40 percent better. Everything is all right. So what we did is we now looked at 6,074 CSF samples that came to us from various hospitals, which are all mentioned here, and we did an R programming on it and. Um, uh, one of the a short term student of this department actually did it. Uh, Bala is also sitting in here and it is the samples came from mainly South India because we are based here and then we are we divided the samples into two kinds. Doctor will give antibiotic at any cost even if I say it is negative because that means you are so sure there is something wrong. That called um, that we call as uh, rule in cases that is this and in that rule in cases we got 38 percent positivity. These are all cases which came to these tertiary care hospitals after being treated outside for more than seven days. Please understand that is why the sensitivities here will naturally fall all sorts of things are happening to these patients. And when they are sure probably it is not an infection but we want to rule out before treating it. That's called we call rule out, and in that case we got 2.3 percent, pretty good specificity for a test like this. We have got a whole lot of organisms, but that's not interesting. The rank order is first came on a 
first it hit in our face is streptococcus pneumonia a bacterium came as the largest I mean uh, is the first in the rank orders second came mycobacterium tuberculosis that's fine third is herpes simplex virus the other way around we should have expected herpes simplex virus to be on the top we didn't which is first then we actually asked let's look at where doctors gave us enough information to say this is meningitis or this is encephalitis what happens so we took such cases and actually analyzed them encephalitis is caused by viruses meningitis is caused by bacteria but on the other hand we started getting a whole lot of bacteria causing encephalitis this was really alarming and this made us sit up and ask another question let's look at individually in each case of these bacteria and streptococcus pneumoniae and mycobacterium tuberculosis which are the top two after all presented as encephalitis seizures that means fits or altered sensorium or behavioral abnormalities is what they presented they didn't present with vomiting and neck stiffness and something like that which is supposed to be meningitis this is quite a information for us is exactly presented like a virus in other words it means that in this country we need to put an alert if you see a very classical encephalitis don't be fooled by it we need to have that alert now not only this we also asked what kind of MRI findings in the brain associate with what pathogen because there are classically textbook based informations saying that um, if you look at hydrocephalus it's always caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis no various other bacteria and other fungi can cause it we found that and in fact if you look at what called parenchymal lesions which are caused mainly by viruses uh, vi sorry viruses here instead they are caused by a whole lot of things including parasites and of course only tuberculoma stood where it is when when a radiologist said this is tuberculoma well I think that's 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 to doubt now well this is even even more important is people used to when I started this test and offering a lot of reaction came saying how do you get bacteria multiple bacteria in brain sometimes we got two bacteria in the brain how did this happen this R programming and AI analysis has allowed us to say that there are so many risk factors for it we'll go ahead and see and this is what total out of the so many positives there are 207 polymicrobials and out of them there are uh, these are the risk factors wherein cancer either a, a road traffic accident and traumatic brain injury HIV immunosuppression transplants or middle ear infections steroids ventilators sinusitis sepsis all of them cause a lot of in the blue is polymicrobial in the green is actually unimicrobial regular infections so we then further analyze that and we divided this polymicrobials into hospital acquired and non hospital acquired and further analyzed it you can see in all these risk factors the red is hospital acquired infections are very common and they are all polymicrobial except HIV rest of them hospital acquired infections increase now today we have a certain flags saying if your patient suffered from any of this before we need to look for bacteria probably even multiple bacteria and treat all of them if you want to save him save him and send him back home on his own feet which is even very more important I believe because the the permanent disability that comes in neurological infections is very crippling so that's exactly is the whole thing well even duration of the illness makes a difference um, the the rank order changes and hospital acquired infections start coming up this is something that we showed so and lessons learned are encephalitis like picture uh, pre presented by bacteria many MRI findings earlier thought to be characteristic of TB and viruses can be caused by bacteria risk factors for hospital acquired polymicrobial infections do occur we need to do um, do I have another two three minutes yeah um, this is what we do in sepsis these are the and we also look for the following uh, 
resistances in the blood directly. We don't do any culture. Directly you take the blood or any particular sample from the lung or, or joint or bone, wherever there is infection, you take that and do sepsis. We look at these following bacteria and these following resistance markers. Well, again, its, it's sensitivity specificity is, uh, has been tested. At the then we did actually a randomized control trial so that we actually prove it forever. We did it in JIPMA, Pondicherry, in neonates, newborn patients. And there were 400 babies were divided into two groups. And one group was treated according to our test. The other was treated according to the standard care. Now we asked the question, what will happen? Well, first in culture, we did far superior. We did four times than the culture. And of course, there's 100% concordance, except those bacteria which are not in my list, which occurred in two cases in this particular thing. And the risk factors which cause infections in newborns are equally balanced in both the groups. The severity at admission is the same between the two groups. But the outcome is entirely different. We are 6 out of 185 deaths in, in, the, in the arm which was administered treatment according to our test, 33 which is the normal, about 18.2 percent. Generally, all our I, in neonatal ICUs have anywhere from 17 percent to 36 percent death rates. Here in this particular study it is that. But the most important thing is there are no deaths in our negatives, whichever is the um, arm, which means Anything significant and serious, we actually detected in this. Well, length of ICU stay reduced, L amount of, sorry, um, amount of antibiotics given reduced one half. And of course, ventilator time, how many drugs were given, how long were they given, what is the dosage, everything reduced. And that's what we reflect saying, actually it gives four times better detection and it reduces mortality, it reduces antibiotic usage, and reduces ICU stay. Now, this is what we call as actionable diagnostic, but this is done on day one. As soon as a patient was admitted, they sent the sample to Bangalore from JIPMA, Pondicherry. So within 24 hours, we, we reported, and that made a big difference for these patients. So I think um, I'll, I'll say, uh, thank you. And students and young faculty, probably all the best for next century. Um, I want to continue 100 not out, uh, started by Dean Rao. I think uh, you need to make it 200 not out. Um, it's, I think it's all on your shoulders. But the most important message I wanted to leave, which is what Rangarajan asked me to do when, when he invited me for a talk, is he said, please tell them that there is something called entrepreneurship. There's a whole lot of research possibilities in enterprises outside. You can create that research environment and you can make something impactful that alters something in the society. And so I thought, have I done my job, Rangarajan? Thank you. That was a nice talk. Uh, um, there is some time for Q&A. Can you differentiate between positive bacteria or organisms versus secondary infections that come up because something else is there? Actually? No, um, you cannot because what we are looking at all pathogens. We are not looking at commensals and, and, and non-pathogenic organisms. So all, whatever we detect is a pathogenic organism. So we believe that needs treatment. And that is in a place where it has no business to be, like blood or lung. It, is, it has no business to be there. So we, we suggest treating it. Okay. Uh, second quick question. What is the input into your art programs and what did the art program do? It's a big question. I, you are, I'm, I'm sure I can discuss with, uh, with you at, 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 at dinner time. I, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, please make sure your questions are, you know, uh, not, you know, doesn't require elaborate answering. Just uh, we can keep that for sub subsequent discussions later on. Um, Please. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, know one thing. This is a wonderful platform to distinguish between uh, viral 
bacterial and fungal infections. Uh, have you considered using it for that mysterious encephalitis uh, disease that sweeps Western UP and uh, Eastern UP and Muzaffarpur uh, in uh, Bihar after the lychees are ripened? Because that is really something that ICMR has not been able to crack. Neither has CDC Atlanta been able to find out. They did come down and say that because the kids were malnourished and ate unripe lychees, they showed those symptoms. But it seems a little dicey. I, I, I'm not convinced with that. I'm not even worried about Muzaffar Nagar encephalitis because it looks like an encephalopathy by clinical means. It could be lychees. I'm not really worried. Every alternate year, we lose minimum by newspaper standards. 10,000 babies in, um, in, in UP, in Gorakhpur. Yes. And um, I have gone several times there, but we don't get any sample because uh, doing a platform like this from a private agency is not politically correct in this country. That's the answer. No, ICMR will not even allow that? No. Yeah, okay. yeah discuss, yeah, yeah. Professor Padmana. Ravi Kumar, the data on hospital acquired infections typical of indian hospitals you think it's a no, global the, phenomenon the organisms are same globally but i think we have a little higher incidence here number one you mean our icu problem is much larger i our icu problem is larger our icus are more crowded and I, our icus are less uh, you know less staff they have whole lot of problems Plus, we are using a little more of antibiotics, thus making our organisms more and more resistant in the ICU, which is the worry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, this can this I add uh, is a very stimulating talk and good. Okay. Coming to the sensitivity, uh, your sensitivity uh, level is about 70 percent, you said, right? 70 percent? Yeah. Now, let me say this. When you do in a laboratory, that is, you test any positive, we are 100%. That's what the entire EU data that I passed through. But what I'm talking about is we never get ki that kind of sample. You'll always get a sample in which the bacterium is fighting the immune system of the patient, plus the antibiotics given by the doctor, and it's quite a sick bacterium. To find that out, it requires slightly different, and you, you, you will fail so to some extent. And we have leveled off from, we have taken from 15% in culture to 72% today, which we are very confident. And uh, people who are treated for even 21 days, 30 days, and all that tramples come, they are we too draw a blank. Yeah, of course, my question was, uh, within that percentage, 70%, let's say, uh, amongst the, all the organisms you had, what is the level of variation in sensitivity? Oh, Did I make my point clear? Yeah, within this, there is there is variation of sensitivity. Yeah, what is that? Sure. The, for example, we have two, uh, both the heels. One heel, Achilles heel here, is um, uh, Enterobacter um, cloacae, and the other Achilles heel is Enterococcus faecalis. These two now and then give me problems, but the rest of the bacteria are phenomenally good. Thank you. Uh, this is a very stimulating. Any questions, you know, you can discuss with him subsequently during dinner time. Um, thank you. I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, C.S. Ramesha. Um, I would like to just share an anecdote with you. He was very, um, uh, he was a big expert in whistling, and if he whistled from here, it can be heard in his village. <laughs> and. Uh, when he went to the U.S., I heard the story that uh, many people went on a tour to a cave and he whistled there and everybody got scared. <laughs> so he's able to scare Americans out of their wits. Anyway, so um, he did PhD in Professor Ganguly's lab here in uh, IASCBC and uh, he went over to the U.S., worked in uh, several uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. He has about 25 years of experience in uh, identifying and characterizing drug candidates. And uh, after uh, such an illustrious career, he started his own company. He's, uh, um, he founded Medus Bio LLC uh, that develops technologies and reagents for drug discovery and diagnostic research. 
So um, he will be talking today on uh, my biomarkers for wearable de devices. Thank you, Jal. Thank you, DN Rao, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to come here to my alma mater and give this talk. Also, before I start my talk, I should salute all my mentors here. As I said, Ganguly is no more here. One of the advantages of joining Ganguly is he left us totally free. We could do anything we wanted. And uh, we enjoy that freedom, collaborated a lot of people and a lot of things. This is, I would say, an inflection point in our life. So as uh, George said, I worked in syntax, letter lay, roads, syntax. Then I started my own company. I'm not going to talk about much company. I'll just give you two slides what we do in that company with regard to the uh, subject matter. And that is where you see the highest reward. And also I have a, a faculty position with UC Santa Cruz where I teach uh, to graduates, postdocs as a part of the industry academic collaborations about pharmaceuticals, drug discovery. And in one of the classes, I start the, uh, my talk with this slide. This forward? Okay. This slide. Yes, let me read this. Doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings whom they know nothing. And I see students comment. And most of them say doctors are dumb, pharmaceuticals are crooks, and patients are fools. But the real take home message from this slide is there's a total knowledge gap in the understanding of the disease and the management of the disease. That is what it says. So in the last, how many, 300 years, we have started to learn incremental progress and is using this knowledge to treat diseases. And we are actually not diseasing it. And in the absence of this knowledge, we are barely managing the diseases. Mostly, we are managing the disease symptoms, not diseases. But in the last couple of decades, there is the pace has picked up with the genomic revolution. And we have begun to scratch the biology of uh, biological systems into greater details. And even though we know genetic, oops, how do I go back? Okay, okay, got it. Stop and spring back. Okay. 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 So genetically you are homogeneous, we say, but it's very misleading. In statistical theory, there's no difference between each one of us. But if you take 1.1% out of say 3.2 billion or 3.5 billion nucleotides, one point a lot of nucleotides, and where is this change is very important. Just one change in, in sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia makes a major difference. So Functionally speaking, we are very heterogeneous. And basically, we are, each one of us is so unique, and we can consider each one of us in a population of one. And many diseases have multiple order pathways, and one drug does not fit all. So how do we move from this management to disease curing or prevention? We are doing the precision medicine. So healthcare concept going forward is to catch the disease before it manifests. And to show this heterogeneity, and say one side does not fit all, these are some of the major diseases I have put in the left side. And all of these diseases have multiple drugs. And this is the percent of the people who are ineffective about any given drug. That means with the combination of two, uh, the, uh, drugs available, doctors have to do a, a, a trial and error experiment on these people to see which one is beneficial. And this ineffectiveness goes from anywhere from 38% to 75% in case of cancer and 38% in case of depression. And now we have taken this further to, uh, to address this heterogeneity and show an example here. This is the best cancer. When we started the treatment, originally it's all chemotherapy. Chemotherapy success rate is less than 12%. Now we have begun to understand 
what is the nature of this breast cancer and there are HER positive, ER positive, PR positive and those which are triple negative for all these three reasons. And we have targeted drugs and the success rate is close to 30% with this monotherapy. And now further doing understanding the biology, we know within these groups there are multiple variates. And so now we have started the combination therapy. Now the success rate somewhere in 50%. But because of this heterogeneity at fine details, we have to go to this N is equal to 1 therapy at an individual level. Okay. And next, where is this heterogeneity come from? And the key point here, here is the proteins are the, that is what matters. See, genes and its products exist in multiple forms and have multiple functions. Although genes make these proteins and proteins functions altered in many ways. We know the lifestyle, environmental factor, epigenetics and also the recent one that is added to this one is the microbiome. And sometimes you wonder, looking at this microbiome, whether you live for microbes or microbes only for you. So this heterogeneity we have to understand. Unless you understand heterogeneity, you won't be able to cure the diseases. And the second thing is, by the time disease clinically manifests, there is too much of damage. There is too much of damage both to the target and the off-target. And it's almost impossible to cure a well-manifested disease. So the alternative is to catch the disease before it manifests. If you look at the progress of the disease, it is something looks something like this. There is an initiation, something happens at the genetic level or at the protein level or somewhere, and then it progresses. It progresses for a long time. Some cases, some cases it may be few weeks, some cases it months, some cases it may be years and decades. And finally, the clinical manifestation is where you are recognized as a disease. You start taking therapy or going to the doctor. By the time you this you how this manifested disease, there is so much of damage that has happened to the system. And that's what we are not very successful in the treatment of the diseases. So now the idea is, can we identify the disease before it manifests itself? Can we catch it in the progression state or even early in the initial stages? And the question is, how can you do this one? And the answer is the biomarkers. Disease is the end result of one or many changes in the biochemical pathways. And biomarkers which are either present or absent, which are increase or decrease or change uh, as a consequence of altered pathways. And can we use this change biomarker as a guide to the therapy? Okay. Then I'll give you two examples here. And this, as I said, manifestation of the disease is very slow. Our, the manifestation of the changed molecular entity, that is the biomarker, is relatively much rapid. Here is two examples. One is the osteoporosis. Osteoporosis basically the bones start degrading and degrading and degrading. And finally, you start severe pain or start breaking your bones and you go to the doctor. This is where we call the disease manifestation. By the time you go to the doctor, there is so much of damage has happened. But there is a biomarker which is, comes very early on in your serum. Once the bones start erosing and it keeps going up and going up much before the manifestation of the clinical uh, manifestation of this disease. Second one is the cardiovascular, the heart attack is the clinical manifestation. And if you can look at the plaque building in the, your arteries, which is not that easy but it's doable, you can catch this heart attack is much early. In addition to that one, in another advantage, there's another factor which is the hype, uh, which is the release by endothelial cells, and this keeps going up as the, the artery starts getting blocked. And you can monitor this one and catch the heart, artery, uh, heart, heart attack much early in this one. And the question is, by using these biomarkers, Constantly monitoring the biomarkers, it is possible to detect the onset of the disease very early and prevent it from clinical manifestation. And this is what we call the predictive diagnostics. There is where the industry is heading in a big way. And predictive diagnostics has the potential to eliminate issues associated with the 
treating manifested disease. As I said, there is so much of collateral damage, there is drug induced toxicity because the amount of drug that you need to use to address this uh, uh, disease is too much and definitely it drug use toxicity is a given and quality of life even after the, all this drug intake is not good enough. And the question is, how do you monitor these biomarkers in a continuous year more frequently? So that is another thing. So another thing about this, it is not about one or two biomarkers. You have to mark, you have to catch the multiple biomarkers, the patterns. So why patterns is rather than one or two biomarkers? Many is better than one. Physiology is a close network of communication within and between the cells. One change, many outcomes. A change in just one node in the pathway, it disturbs many of the pathways within the cell or in within the system, and that creates a, a pattern. And if you just concentrate in one biomarker, that may be replicable to each individual because of our heterogeneity. So if you look at a pattern, we will be multiple biomarkers you will be focusing on, and you will be able to get individual specific patterns. And the second is the time factor. Manifestation of disease is slow. Manifestation of biomarker is fast. Manifestation of bio biomarker mar uh, pattern is even faster. A one or two biomarker reading the clinical significance make time. But a 0.1% increase in one marker, 0.5% in the other marker, and 0.6% in the third marker makes it significant uh, uh, much sooner than one or two biomarkers. That's why the pattern analysis has a much stronger appeal in this connection. And also using this pattern, you can have this risk index. Just like now we what they do the polygenomic index scores once they do the genetic analysis. Using this pattern, you can generate the risk scores from zero to one and see whether it is from zero to one, how long does it take, how fat is increasing, or it's go going forward or going backward. And you can get a true or false alarm using these scores very easily. Now the question is, how do you collect this information in a continuous fashion or a uh, regular, frequent, more frequent fashion? So this is the traditional diagnostics. When you give your blood or biopsy sample, that's basically what they do. They look for the uh, biomarkers. And that takes you know, long, long delay. And it cannot be done in a continuous basis. So to address this one, now what we call have, what we have personal diagnostics, which is portable and wearable devices. They use molecular biomarkers and digital biomarkers. And what are some of the uh, portable biomarkers features are shown here. They are lightweight, they are compact, wearable, and removable, non-invasive. Non-invasive, we don't have to do the VE puncture. Uh, finger prick is OK. And had that to be used in an outpatient uh, fashion. And non-restrictive, that means it can be used in a young adult, male, female, old, young, and handicapped, physically fit, any, anywhere is possible. And the information is connected more frequently than the lab says, or it is connected in a continuous monitor in the case of wearable devices. And importantly, when you are monitoring this pattern, the information is connect, collecting is enormous. So you have to be able to analyze this data. So it has to be smart device compatible. And at least at also it has to be inexpensive and affordable. If you are using non-invasive material, how, what are the sources of material available for such an analysis? And in fact, there are plenty. There is pulse, and there is sweat, there is urine, there is saliva, there is tear, there is exhaled air, temperature, body odor, muscle tone, motion, which is a big thing. And there are other things such as the microbiome. And if you look at these samples, the question that comes, how complete is the information available in these things? All of these have a lot of information. Because of the lack of time, I'll just concentrate on one example, Excel here, in which we are, Mrs. Bio is working. And so Excel here has only Volatile compounds and lipid droplets, fine uh, picolator size lipid droplets. And there are more than 1,000 volatile organic material, 30% of which are food related, rest 90% of indicates the body physiology. 
and you can also get lung specific biomarkers and systemic biomarkers, some of the systemic biomarkers through the lipid droplets and also microbiome biomarkers which are related to the uh, lung infection and things like that. But in all of this material, whether it's sweat or exhaled air or tear, the concentration of the biomarker is often very low. Okay, so and uh, we have a, actually we got a contract from a company to develop glucose test using the breath air. So we developed the chemistry where you have to we have a collection tube. You blow uh, five to ten breaths, and that is a chemistry. The glucose gets oxidized, and we have coupled it to some chain reaction. A red color develops, and they are developing it into a product. Uh, hopefully, it will come into market sometime. And so since the concentration of the biomarker is low, low, we need a different kind of systems. And these systems have to be extremely sensitive, ultra sensitive devices. And uh, along with that one, they have to be miniature and portable because we have to be monitoring almost continuously. And the first generation devices are based on the what material based sensors. Uh, some of the examples, electric noses, resonant cantilevers, nanotubes, and all of these catches the pattern of the healthy and the disease and gives you the scores. Uh, I will give you a few examples, including our own. Uh, Mathers and Dexis, Dexis is another company which is started by another alumni of uh, uh, biochemistry, Subarao. We work together. We have this system, which is a capillary nanoparticle system, which has the capacity to multiplex and has a built-in calibrator, which this detect, detection sensitivity, what of the few of the markers that you are measuring, is less than picogram uh, per ml. And the sample volume is 5 to 25 microliters. You can get the result with 15 to 20 minutes. And we are using this, uh, do a clinical trial for cardiovascular and traumatic brain injury. And a couple of other examples is another, this is the basically a system called field asymmetric ion mobility mass spectroscopy. It is just like your credit card, your size of your credit card. It plugs into a portable device. It is a LC, it is electrophoresis, and it is a mass spec, everything combined here. There is a port here where you put your sample, and sample gets concentrated and goes to the ionizer. It's a two-dimensional electrophoresis, and then the mass spec. And finally, this mass spec generates this pattern. And the pattern, you analyze this one and get the score. Uh, this is uh, developed in the Euro. One which is developed in our own Bay Area is another technology, which is called the PPIN concept, which uses the magnetic particles. And these particles are coated um, uh, bio, um, bio, biomarker specific sensors. And each nanoparticle has unique force and spectra. And when the biomarker is engaged, they fluoresce, they give a unique protein spectra. And how it works? You give these particles IV and they circulate in your blood and they bind if the biomarker is available. Then you wear a watch and it magnetizes it. When you magnetize it, all the magnetic particles come and accumulate under the skin below this watch. And now this has a spectroscopy. You can see the fluorescent spectra of these nanoparticles and get a picture of what biomarkers, which biomarkers have gone up, which biomarkers have gone, uh, gone down, and you can get a score. And the last one is the similar concept. This is the, something which looks like a rice grain, a flattened rice grain, so something like poha, which is implantable uh, under the skin, and the circulating uh, biomarkers bind to these uh, sensors, and they send the signal to the cloud, and you can analyze that one. And some of the low-level uh, these devices already in the market that uh, probably including the Apple Watch and Titbits and some of these more specialized uh, things. While we are talking about this uh, molecular biomedic, there's a big research is going on. A wave is getting created which uses what you call digital biomarkers. <coughs> this is the pathway, biochemical pathway, which is characterizes what's going on in our body. A biology looks at this one and says, oh, it's a network of multiple pathways. An engineer looks at this one, so oh, it is a network of circuits and motors. A mathematician, a physicist looks at this and, oh, it's a massive wave of electrons and atoms. And these engineers and mathematics have a distinct concept, and they have used this idea to 
develop the concept that body is constantly in motion at the molecular atomic level and the nature of this motion is likely to be different in health and diseases. If so, can we possibly understand this nature of this motion using sensors? It's a whole kind of research is going on. I'll just try to summarize everything is here. So artificial intelligence, neuronal network, you know, Mr. Narlik is the key of this one. There is pressure sensor, there is wet sensor, there is motion sensors. All of these ones are using uh, to get data on a continuous basis. And here this is Apple Watch, which is very familiar to you. And there is a company called uh, Misol in France that is developing a pedometer. It has sensors. So they claim onset of the Parkinson's disease can be measured almost a decade in advance. And uh, there is this uh, iPad or the Apple where which has a gyroscope and accelerator which may, every day you spend 10 minutes moving your fingers and it will measure the neuromotor index based on a fever and if it's out of normal it sends a signal. Similarly, a lot of these kind of devices are already uh, being uh, uh, developed or being worked out. And finally, the summarize this digital biomarker. Digital biomarker is a new big thing in predictive, predictive diagnostics. It is a movement-based uh, uh, system. It measures physical, electronic, or electric signals using sensors and algorithms. And it's highly portable and reliable and mounted on the body or around the body. And it monitors the change in the biomarkers in a real time. And it's a and it is unlike the biologists, is right now is dominated by ID companies. And finally, I want to show an uh, example of what is the advantage of this biomarker in the treatment of the diseases. Here, the osteoporosis example I showed you here. Instead of waiting till the disease manifestation, if you concentrate on this biomarker, you see, and see, once it goes significant uh, higher, you start the drug. And then within a few uh, year or a month, the marker goes down. Your bone density basically remains no change. And this patient has no, practically, has, has, doesn't have to go through this uh, pain uh, in, the, in this process. That's one example. Second example, it is about the digital uh, biomarker. This is a Scripps publication. So they use the Fitbit data, which monitor the sleep pattern and the heart rate. And in the five states, and see, people who got infected within 24 hours, their, <coughs> their heart rate changes and sleep pattern gets disturbed. And within three to seven days, they come up with this flu. If you can use this data and sort of get a voluntary quarantine, they won't travel during this time. This commute during, they infect so many people and that's how the influenza gets spread. So that's how we can minimize the spread of the influenza, not only that, this first one, we can give the antiviral very early on at a low dose, you'll get benefit. Another thing I forgot to forgot, mention here, if you go here, the amount of drug you have to give is so high, amount of drug that you have, this you have to give is so low, so drug induced toxicity is almost non-existent. So finally, the, uh, conclude, so it's very easy to probably the, uh, the, uh, uh, the get the uh, upper, um, what's that, uh, get the pattern measurement as a predictive tool, but the key thing is to get the drug for the treatment of the disease. So using this pattern, you can also do the therapy selection as an early proof of efficacy, early proof of concept, and also the clinical trials will be short, clinical trials will be small, clinical failure will be rare, and drugs that we can, be, cannot, or can be developed for many and all the diseases, and these drugs will be safe, effective and affordable. And finally, I would like to, and the journey has just begun a long ways to go, and I would like to thank my collaborators and the people, and there are quite a few people associated with the institute here I would like to mention. Surya is the, uh, oops. Surya is from biochemistry, and Subraf is in biochemistry, he is the owner of Dexis. And Preeti is a graduate from MBU. And Anusha Aras's uh, father-in-law is a faculty here. With that, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ramesha, for that uh, terrific talk. And the last two talks have explained how difficult it is to have a 
diagnosis and how risky the diagnosis process is and so much to be understood about it. Yeah, any one question I can entertain? Yes. Dr. Govinath. <coughs> Genome-based, sequence-based uh, diagnostics, mm. you know, in the, in the context of breast cancer, for yeah. instance, the BRCA gene mutations are detected early. Correct. But there is 30% predisposition for BRCA gene mutations to cancer. Correct. So how justified is doing early mastectomy like the classical case of Angelina Jolie type of <laughs> situation. Yeah. Um, uh, is it justified really? To no, do such I, think, a I think, see, the genome sequencing as we have the genome, uh, polygenomic score, it is mostly for the people who are genetically uh, predisposed to these things. They probably you can justify, but justifying massive on everyone is not going to be done. And uh, that's, that's not going to and happen. The pro probability is 30 percent or so, right? Well, yeah, 30 percent. I mean, but still 70 percent. No, the question is, see, that is because this, yeah. those people are very resistant to the, uh, some of these treatments. But if you can write, identify those people, the correct therapy, the success rate will be a lot better. See, we earlier chemotherapy is only, as I said, less than 12 percent. And with monotherapy, it's become to 30 percent. And with the combination, it's shift almost 50 percent. But as we understand more and more, we are probably going to increase our success rate a lot higher. So the key is to understand you are not only your uh, uh, hereditary disposition, but also all these atomic, uh, uh, environmental factors, you know, mutations that happens during the cell cycles, how do they affect uh, development of these cancers. That's also very important. For that to understand, you have to a continuous monitoring system. You can't do just one time, oh, okay, yes, this is a hereditary case. That's a different one. But a lot of people, it's not hereditary. Just one more, yeah. One more. Last question. Thanks, that was nice. Uh, you showed a fairly disparate range of different markers as well as uh, devices. Now, how do you establish for any given marker uh, especially given the variability in populations and ethnicities. Yeah, that's all biology. That's all the... No, not, not, just, not uh, just the biology yeah. aspect, but how do you establish the causation aspect versus the correlation aspect versus whether it's just an innocent bystander? See, when, you, when your biomarker comes, it doesn't have to be a causation. It has to be an indicator of the disease. As long as it is associated disease, you know that disease is happening, right? So it may be a consequence of disease. It's the bystander of the disease. That means something is wrong is happening in your body. It may not be causing. Causing is important for the development of the therapy. For to say what in, in this diagnosis, preventive diagnosis, you want to see early on whether there is a disease developing. For that, the biomarker doesn't have to be the causing of the disease. As long as it's associated with this, as it is specific to disease, I think that's fine. Thank you. Does it make sense? I'm sorry I have to, you know, uh, because of the time constraint. Um, this is a very interesting talk. Uh, another talk that is, you know, for dinner time discussions and more elaborate uh, details. So I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Shama Bhatt. Uh, he's, you know, a uh, great senior to me. When I first joined in 79, I used to hear about his name but never saw him. So it is a great pleasure for me to uh, invite uh, and call upon uh, the speaker, Dr. Shama Bhatt, a former PhD scholar of the Department of Biochemistry, Indian Institute of Science. He is now the managing director of a diagnostic and biotechnological products manufacturing company called Bhatt Biotech India Private Limited located in Bangalore, which was also founded by him with an extremely practical approach to biological research. He transformed himself from a tenure of professor at Un University of Pennsylvania into a financially successful biotechnology entrepreneur. He will be delivering a talk on cholesterol, MS, HIV, BBI, a journey of success and satisfaction. Please give him a warm welcome, Dr. Shambhar. Thank, thank you. Uh, looks like this is a Guru Vandana meeting. Uh, I'm also, you know, very much indebted to all the professors who were uh, 
you know responsible for uh, you know uh, molding us uh, into whatever we are today i am particularly indebted to professor ram sharma who has been very very helpful in uh, during my stay of for three and a half years uh, uh, here at uh, uh, in the biochemistry department today i'll be talking about the cholesterol to multiple sclerosis to hiv to bhat biotech uh, india private limited a journey of success and satisfaction like um, i think most of us you know my stay here uh, about uh, three and a half years here uh, was one of the best uh, time in my life we enjoyed doing research and uh, en enjoyed the life also i joined professor ram sharma's lab and uh, started on the project on a mevalonate pyrophosphate decarboxylase as a regulatory step for the cholesterol biosynthesis uh, in rat liver unlike uh, anand swarup i have to work uh, 48 hour cycle not just uh, you know 9 to 5 because i was doing the circadian rhythm studies i did the purification of a melanate pyrophosphate decarboxylase by using uh, the para comorate uh, basically gained i was also secretary of the biological sciences association or uh, biochemical society here organized uh, 46 plus uh, lectures we also had a conference uh, on uh, lectures on the Nobel Prizes in uh, 1977, presided over by Professor C. N. R. Rao. And uh, we brought a souvenir, uh, I think uh, that may be available in the in exhibition. We had uh, good success and uh, had several publications. The key findings were uh, sure that mevalonate pyrophosphate decarboxylase also regulates the synthesis of cholesterol Unfortunately, we could not take it further. And uh, as everybody, you know, we moved to uh, USA, that is University of Connecticut Health Center, Farmington. Um, I stayed there from 1979 to 1983. I joined the lab of Stephen Pfeiffer uh, in the microbi microbiology department, uh, where we studied the development of uh, myelin synthesis uh, and its implication on the neurodegenerative disease, multiple sclerosis. We had several publications here. I will not go into the details. Uh, key findings were uh, showed that oligodendrocyte development and myelin synthesis is regulated by a factors, uh, by factors regulated, secreted by astrocytes. Developed a novel and easy method for the in vitro culture of oligodendrocytes, the myelin forming cells. I see that uh, even today, many people are using this method for studying the myelin biosynthesis. After that, uh, I joined the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and stayed there uh, from uh, 1983 to 1994. Joined as a research associate in the laboratory of uh, Professor Donald Siberberg, who was also working on uh, myelin and uh, multiple sclerosis and then as an independent scientist with uh, my own lab. Continued the studies on myelin biosynthesis regulation by for about uh, two years. Got the opportunity to work on the demyelination in AIDS patients because of the similarities between multiple sclerosis and uh, AIDS patients. Major breakthrough was the discovery of galactosylceramide as a receptor for HIV in brain cells which was published in Science. The discovery was uh, reported in the US and in Indian newspapers. Even today I see that yes, uh, just yesterday or day for yesterday I saw a paper saying that uh, some mucosal cells uh, have got uh, sulfatides which, will be, which are used um, as receptors by HIV. Here we had uh, several uh, publications. Again, I will not go into details. I'll just show the key findings uh, at Penn. Studied the neural cell adhesion molecule, that is NCAM, in oligodendrocytes and its role in the regulation of uh, myelinogenesis. Showed that galactosylceramide or related molecules serve as a receptor for HIV in the human brain. Also showed that benzopurpurin and related molecules can inhibit the binding of HIV to brain cells. 
we mapped the amino acids 206 to 275 of uh, GIP 120 as the binding region to galactosyl ceramide. From there, we decided to come back to India and uh, uh, we decided that uh, we want to set up a company and uh, set up Butt Biotech India Private Limited. Initially, there were uh, several hiccups, but I will not go into the details. Uh, this is in 1994, we started Butt Biotech with the help of uh, two of my friends. One is Krishna Bhatt, who was uh, a student of Kama, and uh, another one is Ramesh Bhatt, who is not related, but uh, he's a good friend of mine. He started with uh, a 5,000 square feet building, and now we have more than 70,000 square feet uh, building, which houses uh, manufacturing, marketing, uh, administration, and uh, R&D. We are celebrating 25th year uh, this year. Just to uh, give you uh, some, uh, you know, snapshots. Uh, company history is company registered in 1994, like uh, Ravi Kumar. We also one of the pioneers in uh, now setting up a diagnostic uh, companies in India. And uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, we had. Uh, the third expansion of 40,000 square feet in uh, 2009. Milestones of uh, product launch, uh, we started with the pregnancy test, the rapid test. We are the pioneers in that. We are the first one to bring a rapid uh, that lateral flow immunochromatography based uh, test to India. And every year, uh, we have been uh, uh, launching uh, two to three products. At present, uh, we have more than 100 products. The company size is um, about 350, uh, production 210, marketing about 60, uh, R&D 50, and administration 30. Quality is a way of life for Bud Biotech. We have uh, certification from uh, outside agencies for ISO 9001, ISO 13485, and the GMP from the Government of India, and the uh, CE certifications. A snapshot of uh, production facility. We started uh, with all manual process, and now we are getting into automation. Uh, more than uh, 60 to 70 percent of the production is done by automation today. We have uh, a big uh, range of uh, products. Uh, of course, a rapid test uh, comprises. Uh, for more than 80 to 85 percent in ELISA, molecular diagnostics, hematology test, and uh, life science products, instruments, blood collection tubes, biochemistry reagents, etc. These are some of the pregnancy test, Parikshak uh, HIV test, HEPA scan, hepatitis B test. These are all rapid tests. Sir, some of the instruments. We are the first one to develop a indigenous uh, PCR uh, uh, instrument. You can see here, which is very low cost. Uh, we are selling uh, less than one lakh rupees. We have more than 150 uh, installations uh, in India. We are also doing contract manufacturing for uh, several companies. Uh, Piramal and HLL are uh, major ones. For Piramal, we are supplying uh, their uh, ICAN and uh, INO. These are the product um, pregnancy and uh, ovulation uh, test kits. In addition to marketing in India, we are uh, also exporting more than 30 different countries we are exporting. Even though market size is not that much, but uh, we are hoping that uh, you know pretty soon we will uh, increase that. Research and development uh, is a major part for Bud Biotech because we are a technology-based company. So we develop uh, most of our uh, products uh, in-house. So we have um, rec sorry, <coughs> we have recombinant proteins and antibodies, molecular diagnostics, devices and uh, sensors, diagnostic and uh, biochemistry kit development, contract research uh, services. 
a snapshot of um, um, our R&D lab. We are collaborating with uh, several institutions. IAC is uh, one of them. Uh, Manipal University, National Institute of Research and Tuberculosis, um, and uh, NIMHANS, to name a few. Since uh, uh, diagnostics is a very competitive market, you know, we have to be very competitive with respect to the price. So to be competitive, what we have to do is we have to develop our own uh, raw materials and reagents so that we'll be able to compete with particularly the Chinese. We develop our own uh, recombinant antigens for uh, HIV, hepatitis B, malaria, dengue, chikungunya in-house. And also we develop uh, monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal antibodies. And then uh, I will uh, come back to the next slide. Molecular diagnostic research, uh, we have developed uh, both uh, uh, molecular diagnostics for uh, dengue, cytomegalovirus, HPV, HIV, all this. They are in the process of uh, licensing now. Contract research also we are doing for uh, pharma and healthcare uh, companies. DNA barcoding is uh, one of the major uh, uh, services which we are doing uh, for several pharma companies. Biomedical department uh, projects on uh, new medical devices. We have a group that works on uh, building instruments. Uh, we have built a PCR machine uh, indigenously and we have developed uh, electrical method for the detection of DNA amplification machine and uh, uh, by using impedance method. We are now working on uh, developing instruments uh, for the measurement of uh, glycated hemoglobin and uh, uh, microscope uh, for uh, digital microscope for tuberculosis. Biosensor based uh, products what uh, we have developed uh, or developing our uh, hemoglobin meter, glucometer, uh, rapid test uh, readers, or uh, organic thin film uh, transistor or OTFT based uh, thyroid hormone detection uh, uh, instrument. Uh, this is a GITA uh, funded project. Uh, uh, UK based company New Drive is a, one of our partner and in IASC uh, Satish Patil is our collaborator. We had a uh, few publications and also filed uh, five patents. Social responsibility, that's uh, as a socially responsible organization, but Biotech is uh, investing its uh, resources in socially relevant projects. We have initiated a financial support system to the children of our employees for their education. We have adopted uh, a nearby school and we provide financial assistance to the students of economically backward classes. We have also instituted several scholarships in colleges to the economically backward and uh, bright students. We also identify the deserving students and provide them with the financial assistance for their education. Uh, in addition to what biotech, uh, we have uh, other ventures like uh, polymeric sensors at uh, IIT Bombay. Uh, this is for water testing um, uh, equipment. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, did not uh, take off, so we have to shut down. And the stem cell research also did not work because of uh, there was no clear-cut regulatory uh, uh, system available. Uh, but Biotech Healthcare, uh, under this, we have uh, Dr. Butts Lab, Dr. Butts Pharmacy, Dr. Butts Clinic. So just started, we have uh, several labs running now, and hopefully we'll be uh, going uh, on the national level. Navachetan Retirement uh, Residency, Private Limited uh, in Puttur, uh, in uh, Dakshin Kannada district. This is a social entrepreneurship. As you know that, uh, the villages are becoming now uh, old age homes because most of the children are uh, either going abroad or to the city and uh, there is nobody to take care of um, uh, the you know older people. So realizing that uh, to have a dignified life in their old age home, we are uh, 
providing uh, Navachetana retirement uh, township in which uh, they can buy properties and they can um, live there. Whenever they need, they will be provided whatever uh, services required for the old age. This is not a, um, a it's um, a service oriented uh, this thing, not a real estate business. So we are uh, providing this and hopefully already started and uh, uh, doing quite well. We hope that, you know, that will take off um, uh, to other areas also than Puttur. This is my dream, but uh, I don't know whether uh, whatever uh, time left, I will be able to do it. I want to do like a ATM machine, a anytime diagnostic machine. We are working on it. Hopefully, we'll be able to complete that. That uh, you go to the machine and uh, just uh, put your fingers, you will get the report. Now, uh, just uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, success and satisfaction. Success, uh, had good success as a researcher with good publications and uh, recognition in the scientific world. Running a company for more than uh, 25 years. Developed many state of the art products uh, and uh, marketed them. Satisfaction because uh, employed more than 400 uh, people directly and another 500 uh, indirectly. I get a very, the satisfaction because, you know, uh, as I said, more than uh, 300 people we employ out of that, more than 80% of them are women, those who are coming from the lower strata. And they will come and say that, sir, because they say that, you know, our life is uh, running because of you because their husbands are, uh, you know, they are drunk and uh, they don't uh, work. So, they, unless uh, they earn and uh, uh, without uh, their, uh, you know, input, they, they will not be able to run their family. Helped more than 500 uh, people in getting good education by way of uh, grants and uh, scholarships, providing diagnostic kits to the government uh, in combating uh, bioterrorism and uh, test for uh, high altitude survival. So we are uh, providing a rising test, which is one of the, considered one of the bioterrorism molecules. Uh, every year we are supplying uh, this rising kit to the central government. And a pioneer in uh, rapid test development uh, in India and uh, development of low cost diagnostics products to reach the masses. Uh, we started Make in India in 1994. Uh, now Modi is saying Make in India uh, very recently. Just a word of personal life. Uh, married to Sushila Bhatt just before we left uh, for USA on April 6, 1979. She has been a rock supporter uh, in all my ventures. I have a very happy married life. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, there is some time for one or two questions only. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice talk. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Jar Thomas. Um, it's interesting and uh, uh, a very great opportunity for me today because um, I'm chairing a session that is related to application of you know, biological research. At the same time, I'm also introducing my senior, uh, Jod Thomas, in the session. Earlier, I introduced Dr. Ravi Kumar, who was my batchmate, so it's like you know, one step equal and one step above. Um, it was, uh, I mean, there are uh, several of my um, uh, colleagues at the time made a lasting impression on me. Uh, they actually helped me in molding, shaping my way, the way of my thinking and how I pursued my career. And um, I'm uh, very proud to mention that Jod Thomas, my senior in the lab, is one of them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. This lab. So I got a, you know got to the lab and I met Professor Padayati. He said there are two pro projects in this lab. 
one is phage, other is rice. You work on rice. Uh, phage is too easy. And uh, then I had to stay for seven years. Rice is a very difficult system. Phage people like YBBK Subramaniam finish in four years and disappear. And the rice fellows get stuck. But you know, it was uh, hard work. And um, eventually it led to a nature paper as you might have seen in the uh, exhibition. Just wanted to speak one minute about it. Um, so we wrote up the paper and we were ready to send it off. I had a thought. Max Bernstein, a brilliant scientist, he was working on histone genes of sea urchins and keeps publishing in Cell and Nature and all that. So I was pretty sure that this will go to him for review. But then IASC of course has a big network of postdocs all over the world. And so through my sources I learned that he is helping a group in, in Europe to do plant, some plant histone genes. So I was in two minds. Should I write to the editor uh, to avoid this guy as a reviewer? I said, what the heck? I, most likely this won't get even reviewed. So I just sent it out without any comment. Paper was published uh, without any questions. And uh, about four years later, I met Sadashiv Karnik, who was one of our microbiology friends. <coughs> He told me that he was working in a lab adjacent to Max Bernstein's lab and my paper had actually gone to Max. I didn't know that until then and Max had accepted it without any question. So the, the lesson is don't be scared of, you know, competitors or perceived competitors. Science will always prevail. So with that, uh, I'll just go on to <coughs> My talk, I think I'll have to skip a few slides. I, first, I thought I'll uh, talk a little bit about the company for which I'm working, but since there is a lot of, uh, you know, shortage of time, I'll uh, just quickly run through. So we have two facilities, one in uh, Cochin and the other in Hyderabad. And th this is all started as a site genome, uh, you know, is the first company and we have not, we are a group of companies under site genome. I, work for AgriGenome, but uh, there's another company called MedGenome, which was also incubated in SciGenome and came out of it. And there are a few more other small companies like that. So we have two activities. One is commercial and the other is our own R&D. The commercial activities like uh, sequencing, bioinformatics, um, you know, Sanger sequencing and helping breeders to develop uh, speed, to, to do speed breeding. All of that is our revenue stream. and uh, all that revenue goes into, uh, sorry, into our R&D efforts. So R&D efforts, um, I'll come to come to that a little later. So these are the platforms that we use for our services. I don't want to go into details of this. We uh, we serve academic clients, a big list of them. We serve uh, commercial clients. I don't want to go into the even the services. We do provide all uh, kind of NGO services. We'll come to R&D. <coughs> so <coughs> one thing that we do is to develop high quality reference genomes. Of what? That's a question that we asked ourselves of things that are very relevant to India, which is the bottom line. So one that uh, got recently published in uh, uh, Nature Genetics, I'll come back to that in a minute, is the Indian Cobra genome, uh, the highest quality snake genome published ever and we are uh, working on medicinal plants because those are very relevant to India and uh, you know some of them are native some are not but very important for Indian cuisine so and they, they have a lot of medicinal values attributed to them so by genetic analysis can we uh, validate any of those that was the question then uh, in India we have a problem uh, the government has still not uh, allowed uh, GMOs to be, you know, used as food and we don't know if at all it will come. I think it will come. Maybe GP can <laughs> vouch for that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, so we have to have alternative uh, um, technologies ready for improving crops. So that's why we entered into, ventured into tilling. We are also developing GMO technologies so that we are technology ready if and when uh, the government uh, decides to support that. So 
in our uh, tilling studies, we have uh, gone quite far in uh, rice. I'll come to that in a second. We have done a little bit of tomato. And uh, we are also developing a platform for CRISPR. So we haven't done any great uh, science with it. It's just a demonstration that is proof of concept that we are capable of doing um, editing in our lab. And we are uh, trying to do some protein expression. We use sugarcane as a model system. It has several advantages. It has some disadvantages also. But uh, I will not go into that because it's too preliminary. I just want to talk for a second about uh, one of the work by one of our groups. Uh, you know, the Cygenome group was started by an entrepreneur by the name of Sam Santosh. And uh, so his concept is that we have to be, um, you know, relevant to this society. We have to do things for this society. So many of the global genome projects do not have Indian representation. Do not have means adequate, uh, adequately. So very sporadic representations. And uh, so that's one thing. Second thing is Indian. If you call uh, somebody an Indian, in terms of genomics, who is an Indian? We are all mixed populations. And there are many tribals, you know, tribal population. There are many genetic groups, you know, divided by language, by culture, by so many different things. And we are all, in terms of genomics, completely mixed. So <coughs> we have to have representation in many different population groups. So to bridge that gap, we formed a consortium called Genome Asia 100K. The idea is to sequence 100,000 genomes in Asia, out of which quite a large number will be in India. So the first uh, publication has come. It, uh, about 1,700 uh, individuals have been completely sequenced and analyzed, and Nature thought it fit to put it on the cover of Nature. So <coughs> The second paper that came, that came in December of 2019. And in January, we got another paper in Nature Genetics. Half of the work was done in uh, agri-genome. And we decided to study, you know, we have been obsessed with this uh, venom issue, snake bite issue. It is really very terrifying. We conduct an annual international conference every year. and. Uh, we have been having sessions on snake bite and the consequences of that, and it's really scaring. So it prompted us to study this in greater detail so that we can develop more effective antivenoms. <coughs> so this uh, came on the cover of Nature Genetics in January, that is last month. So to briefly, uh, there are about 22,000 genes expressed in, uh, in this cobra out of which 12,000 genes are expressed in the venom gland. And uh, we identified about 139 toxin-like compounds from 33 toxin groups. But we could get 19 toxins that were found to be expressed in the venom gland. So we have all this information. And I just want to tell you that this, these two papers are open access. And all the data generated in these two projects are completely open to the public. Anybody can generate uh, vaccine uh, based on this information if you are interested. A few other publications. We sequenced uh, a, the purple rice, which is of interest to me. It's a very interesting rice. Every part of the plant is very rich in anthocyanins and uh, purple in color. Yeah, we also work on wildlife genomics. and. And of course, uh, this cobra can be considered as part of it. So <coughs> a herpes virus infection kills elephants in our uh, local forest. So 22 elephants were dead. And uh, so we decided to work on that in collaboration with the Kerala Forest uh, Research Institute. So we have sequenced the, um, the herpes virus from the infected uh, animals. And uh, we also worked on a baculovirus, which infects uh, T. looper. It's a major pest in the eastern uh, region. And so we wanted to develop, I time permits, I'll talk on, I'll give, uh, present two slides on that. <coughs> now on to what we are currently doing. As I said, spice is an important thing for us. 
So, uh, curry leaf is the first candidate that we took. I do not want to go into the details of all these medicinal values and all, it is that many such things are attributed to it. We have got a <coughs> reference genome. Now, our initial <laughs> interest was to show that by using minimal number of platforms, we can get a good quality genome. So, long read technology using PacBio is a bit expensive. Can we avoid that? That was the question we asked. And uh, using 10x and paired end, high C and uh, bionano optical mapping alone, we could get this. So, you can see the chromosome number is 9 and And uh, this scaffold count we got is 16. So, it is near chromosome level and you can see the N50 value is uh, nearly 32 and uh, over 90 we have you know uh, 90 MP we, we have 26.3. So, this is compared to um, in the rutaceae family the only other uh, available sequence is from uh, citrus. So, we are comparing with it with the published citrus uh, reports and we seem to have got much better data. But the COBRA genome having come in nature genetics, now we want to really you know improve this and so we are currently we are working on PacBio, RNA-seq and ONT and another high C approach so that we can get a much much uh, better quality genome. So, it stands here, this is the genome, it is a phase genome. So, you have phase 1 and phase 2 both uh, separately sequenced. And one thing I forgot to tell you is that in this, in this snake genome, we have done all this high quality genomics and then at the end of it, we did a chromosome separation. Individual chromosomes have been separated by some sort of dis, uh, laser dissection. I do not know exactly how it was done and individual chromosomes were sequenced to sort of you know validate uh, the data that we previously got. We are trying with plants, but plants is a different game. Uh, we are not successful yet. So, since that is uh, nearly complete and should go out in a few months, we started working on the next spice which is cardamom. And the cardamom also we have got very good see the N50 is uh, nearly 50 MB. So, um, we, the chromosome number is I think 24, oops, chromosome number is 24 and we have got 43 scaffolds. So, it is uh, pretty good, uh, sorry, no banana is this one, we are comparing with banana, sorry. This is the banana, this is our sequence. So, it is a comparison with that banana. So, I do not have time to explain also I am just rushing through. So, um, okay, that is about the genomics. Many other things are going on. I will not talk about it. This is tilling. Tilling is a very simple mutagenic approach to um, find phenotype variations. It is a very laborious process. Nobody generally indulges in that, but uh, we thought that since we cannot do GMO, we might as well try some, you know, put in some effort into this. So, we got one mutant, this is in rice, it is a uh, variety called Samba Masuri, which is a very popular variety. It is also known as Punni and, uh, and Sona Masuri and all that, yeah. It is a very fine quality rice, we mutated it and uh, we got a <coughs> early maturing plant. It gives an advantage of 15 days. So, you can see that here tillering is just starting, whereas this is ready for harvesting. So, that is the comparison with this. Now, is there any problem with it? So, it is a non-GMO approach. It gives 15 days advantage. It is fine grain. It is slender. There is no yield penalty, but there are problems with it. The eating quality has slightly deteriorated. So, we are now back crossing to uh, get rid of that uh, negative part. But this property is uh, stable in even in the seventh generation. We have come to seven generations. Another uh, rice that we got is a higher yield, it gives about 20 percent increased yield, but there is a penalty in the sense it takes 5 days longer. So, uh, but the 20 percent yield is uh, definitely um, you know worth uh, the 5 days, that is what we feel. This one uh, does not have the other problem that is the eating quality and all that. So, uh, we think that this may be 
ready for uh, market pretty soon, not right away, but yeah. We got some in tomato also, so we have different uh, sizes and shapes and this apparently is uh, very useful as a salad tomato because once you slice it, all the slices will have the same size and <laughs> you do not have to throw anything away. So that is about tomato and then we are, so all that work is done in Hyderabad because where we have field facilities, we do not have it in Kerala, this is done in Cochin, trying to develop a genome editing platform. I am not going to go into this details, but suffice to say that uh, <coughs> CRISPR Cas9 method um, was uh, you know uh, sort of um, adopted for uh, editing by Doudna and uh, uh, Chapentier and it has been about 10 years now and in the last one year or so I see that every new issue of major journals come with a significant innovation or an improvement in the system. And one of the brightest uh, such articles that I have seen is called Prime Editing from Broad Institute. I, I do not have time to go into details, but <coughs> suffice to say Prime Editing gives a new meaning to the word, to the term precision editing. In normal CRISPR-Cas9, you can choose the exon, you can choose the approximate position but you cannot choose the exact uh, mutation that you will get because it is based on homologous uh, recombination. Whereas here it is single standard break. So one strand is broken, mutation introduced, sealed and then the other strand is broken and repaired. So since it is single standard, there are no errors uh, of recombination. So, okay, and rush through. I selected uh, Periaculum 1 which is a TNAU variety. The main advantage, it is a very popular variety, so it is commercially important, but more than that it is amenable to tissue culture. We can regenerate, uh, you know, and so transformation should be possible in this. Now if it is a tomato, it must be red, but uh, can we have a quick and dirty experiment whereby we can change the color of tomato and show that editing works. So what will we do? This is the pathway, one enzyme CRT ISO, carotenoid isomerase that converts pro lycopene to lycopene. Lycopene is the red pigment. So can we block off that? So that was the question. Uh, earlier uh, studies of natural mutants had shown that uh, this is the um, effect if you have mutation in that gene. There is some difference in the flower uh, petal color and there is some difference in the um, leaf color also. I am not going to go into this. We selected exon 1 and uh, 5 prime UTR for uh, the guide RNAs, cloned it uh, and uh, transformed it into to, uh, uh, tomato and after uh, rooting transfer to the uh, greenhouse and then wait for the results. When the fruit comes out, will it be red or orange? We got the tangerine colored. So that means this has worked. We got several mutations, but I will not go into details. Just to show that the flower, the leaves showed the typical pattern, yellow when it is young, uh, green as it matures. The, petal, the petals are uh, white, paler than the wild type and the fruit is uh, tangerine in color. You can see these a little more clearly in this closer photograph. Okay, we got the phenotype. What happens to the gene? Yes, we got a deletion, we got an insertion, and we also got a biallelic, several biallelic, uh, you know, plants. So we have shown that uh, phenotype is there, gene, gene is altered. What, hap what happens is the protein. So the protein is a 616 amino acid uh, protein, but because of these mutations that A and um, G variation, you will get a premature uh, termination and so it will be reduced uh, to one fourth of its original size, so obviously it will not be functional. What happens to lycopene in the fruit? In the wild type, uh, the lycopene peak is present, three different plants. This is the mutant, three different plants. Lycopene peak disappears, pro-lycopene peak appears. So 
you know by molecular evidence by at uh, the product level or at the gene sequence level or the phenotype level we have been able to show that this actually works in our hands. We are also looking at rice trying to make uh, high amylose rice, high amylose means uh, low glycemic index. So hopefully it will be good for obese people and uh, you know diabetics and all that. We have some success there is uh, some mutants that we got which shows slightly higher uh, amylose content but it needs to be worked further. So it is only preliminary. This is about the um, in baccalovirus. This we identified in the tea gardens um, you know there was a complaint that um, th there is destruction by this uh, talaka. So we collaborated with Dr. Babu Azaria of TRA the Tea Research Association. Uh, we collected uh, dead insects, I, I isolated the virus. Uh, you know we did whole genome sequencing and then with Babu we tried to develop a formulation. In fact we developed a formulation um, which we have done limited field trials and uh, it needs to be approved by the um, central insecticide board. So for that we need to do a lot more extensive field trials. So we are you know that is yet to be done but otherwise the people who have tried it are very happy with it um, and we have also done a tea tasters analysis to see if there is any taint, there is no taint. So it is uh, it we feel it is a good product. So want to thank uh, Boni Kuriakos, he was my PhD student earlier. He is leading the group in uh, Cochin lab and uh, Neetu and Rana two excellent scientists you know they have done most of the work in uh, the uh, editing part. Pro Dr. Uh, Reddy heads the group in Hyderabad. He and Radeya did uh, all the field work uh, for the tilling experiments. Sam Santosh is the uh, entrepreneur uh, whose vision has made all these companies survive and his uh, theme is that if you can publish in nature I will fund you. So you know we are trying our best to uh, do good work that will reach nature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you George. Um, Sorry it took time longer. Time for two questions. Okay. No question. No this is only proof of concept. We are not going to use it as a crop at all. We just want to show that it is done. We have not eaten it. Yeah, Ram Rajshekar is an old friend. He used to work with uh, work in uh, was a Shastri's lab. And one thing I noticed uh, after he became a faculty member and all uh, is that any FBG meeting or any conference I go to, if there is a poster prize, only his students will get it. I don't know how he manages it, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But of course, I have seen the posters also, they are very high quality very posters. So, okay, that is very impressive. So, he did PhD as I said here. Um, <coughs> he moved to US later uh, to do his postdoc at uh, University of yes, Illinois. Uh, then he returned to India and joined as assistant professor one here. He is uh, uh, elected to the three academies. And for his outstanding contribution in biology, he received the National Bioscience Award for career development in 2001. Yeah, I invite uh, Ram to give the lecture. On ah, yes. I think this is the last one. I will take definitely 15 minutes. That I guarantee you. <laughs> what I wanted to share before I start what uh, the journey which I have gone through, I wanted to tell you one important thing about the department. As a student, I have lived here. As a faculty, I lived here. Literally, I fought with the every chairman during my term. <laughs> I fought with every of the faculty during my term. What is so striking about all these, we fight on an issue that was understood by my faculty. That way, my big thanks to all my colleagues who is currently there in this. The longest 
at the biggest fight I always make with Professor Muniappa and the divisional chairman D.N. Rao, which I used to do, but these are all issue based. I hope this culture of issue based looking at life is very important, especially in scientific field. And another striking example which I can give you when I started my career, right here as a faculty. I can walk into anybody's lab, doesn't matter what it is, whether I fought with them just a few minutes ago or I fought with them 10 days ago. What you ask, they give without any hesitation. These are all the two important quality which I have experienced. I have moved away from such a wonderful experience to the completely different culture called CSIR culture, where a director is a dummy god and he's a dummy forever, <laughs> not a demigod. I have experienced both parts of the world. People talk about experience of freedom. To understand the freedom in the world, you have to be a slave at one time. But I understood the freedom of Indian Institute of Science at Biochemistry Department after going to CSIR. Now you understand? That is very crucial for everyone. That way I have a world of experience with respect to moving from one place to another place. As the one faculty in this nation migrated large number of states. What is very interesting, you may say how this man from a village came all the way. Today I stand in front of you with the intentionally I put on a coat because I came with the minimum clothes to my department. In 1981, and the entire faculty was sitting there. I went into the interview room with the trunk and the bed from the railway station to the interview room with an assumption, so everybody you should take away my suitcase, the first visit to this city. I never seen city before. And it's very interesting. The interview went on minimum 58 minutes. And I had the longest hair you might, not, you might have seen in many of the old photos. And the entire interview, was done in English. Professor Krug used to translate in Tamil. I used to write it on the board. Look at where I can't speak a word of an English. Today I can give an oration on this, not on English, on my subject area. That is the growth which the department has. <laughs> and what is strange, and my seniors, my teachers identified at that time in 1981 uh, there is a one guy who may be a what to looking into and uh, I did not ditch them the later part of their life. At least their decision at that time was correct. I lived up to their expectation. Now let me come back. Why do I have to start uh, doing research? When I come back from US, everybody says you continue your postdoctoral work. Unfortunately, I cannot do any of those because I did some part of the work in the industry. Then I have to start asking a simple question. That is the question which I have put up there for you. Is what controls the carbon movement from one storage molecule such as a carbohydrate to your protein or an oil? Who makes the decision of this carbon should be here or there? Is the question, the simplest question we asked. To answer this question, I have taken this molecule as my favorite molecule. It was first introduced to me by Professor P. S. Shastri. And till today, I have could not get out of the lipid till today. It is so slippery molecule, I get up and go to any organization, I slip and back into lipid zone, which I can tell you the number of years I spent time on trying to understand lipid, what I have understood is not much, but one thing I have learned. Lipid, you can use lipid to make money out of it. A person from a village born as a beggar today, a decent living I have. That is the classical example. That what I wanted to tell you to my students, biochemistry is the subject where you can fit into any field you like. Today I am called the head of microbiologist, even though I did all my studies in biochemistry. Okay. That way the classical biochemistry is coming back, it's always nice. That is my statement to my students in this. Now I am going to my subject area where I get fascinated with what I do. The question which we ask, you all ask, 
the only molecule which I really love is triacyl glycerol, which you see the structure. It is just nothing but a glycerol. It is the three carbon compound. Where three different enzymes comes and keep adding a acyl group, otherwise called the fatty acids group, and create a structure called a triacyl glycerol. And it is a modern name. Still, people like old name called triglyceride. And these triglycerides, it is just they hate water. I mean, they have to live in this water environment in 55 millimolar water. How do they really stay? They stay as a, a particle-like structure called lipid droplets. And this was the interest, the fascinating subject which I wanted to study. My question was, it's very simple. How a decision is made, you have triacyl glycerol to be assembled. Why I talk about assembly of triacyl glycerol? Because fatty acid synthesis is a must for the survival of the cell. If there is no membrane, there is no life. But can I have, even the system is so much driven to make fatty acid, can I take all these fatty acid, put it into my triacyl glycerol and make myself fat? And that was the interesting question we asked. And we have selected, to, we have to choose a model system. And that was the tough part which we had. But if you look at the synthesis, what you are trying to show you here is, is a glycerol 3 phosphate. The slide is moved. It's just a carbohydrate. Keep adding fatty acids. Finally, you get a little bit. And it is the one of the, the largest selling molecule and the tastiest molecule. And that's the only molecule that kills you in the end as well. Okay? That's the beauty of it. Now, now let me go back to the, the first model system which I have started. It's a very beautiful model system. They will ask why you are working on a, such a colorful organism called a rhodotorella glutinous. It is a pink in color. Why did I work on? This is the one organism after the, the, the nuclear bomb in Japan. The entire Japanese agriculture was jammed. This organism gave life to them. It was the, one of the oldest organisms they have cultured in their country and it used as a food. I thought it would be worthwhile really looking at it and it produces largest commodity oil. What is the weight? More than 50% of the dry weight is as a non-oil. I, the question what we ask, what is the kind of mechanism which has, which can do this job? Is the question which we asked. Everybody knows one part, is it the lipids are actually made. Now I will go back and one step and really ask you. If you take any textbook of cell biology or biochemistry, the entire triacyl glycerol biosynthesis, a possible lipid biosynthesis, all happens at the endoplasmic reticle. And in addition, what they say, there is a substrate for the enzymes which are involved in these acylation is acyl coenzyme A. These are all the two concepts which is there in biochemistry, but I am going to show you, and that is not the only thing. There are variations which exist, and that is this organism gets. What we have done as a biochemist, we love to grind any tissue you give. That is the beauty of our old department, and I am very good at it, grinding this. Go to Dian Rao's lab, borrow pesticidic pump, and go to our uh, Professor Muniapa's lab, borrow some gel apparatus, run. Grind and run gels and purify complexes, and finally, we are the first one to isolate a complex, which has 10S complex, which is not membrane bound. It is soluble in nature. The old idea of what you talk about, it is a membrane bound, it is not a non, it is a non-membrane bound, otherwise called soluble or cytosolic, whatever you want to call it as. And the second concept which we broke is, it is not that we are talking about acyl coenzyme A. In this case, what we are talking about is the fatty acid is activated as a form of, not as the coenzyme A, but it is activated as a part of acyl carrier protein. And that was actually done during fatty acid biosynthesis. That's what we study. And after we isolate, we have, we have isolated. Our department is so wonderful. And whenever we need money, I just go other side of the lab, which is Professor Rangarajan's lab. We go and ask him. Before you ask, he'll say, take. I, he never asked till today what I am taking. And he never asked. I never told him also. Today also, I'm going to tell him the same. I am not going to ask. I am coming. I'm taking and go away. This is the one, there is a relationship which we had. It is exactly like a husband and wife. We go and fight for all day and then go and have a very great time, great tea, and that is my department. That is my colleagues. I want all my old colleagues to really maintain this. It was the one which I cherish even today. I have seen more organizations than any of my colleagues, but I can tell you, that's very, very crucial for our own. And 
One last part which we need to really show you is how I have managed to get a grant. So far, I've been talking about borrowing and doing. And now I need to find a way to really take into. Once you know the cheapest ways to isolate these complexes, we have decided to propose, OK, I can sell it to a company. You can take small molecules, screen, and obesity can be reduced. All these blah, blah. We, did. we collected money. We filed the patent. Remember. In the Institute of Science, we filed a, a global patent, and that came out of this simple discovery, what we had. And because of this, then I asked the next question. If the model system, what you have, is an oleogenous yeast, can this be there? I cannot do genetics. I am not a genetist. I used to teach genetics, which includes Professor Muniapa, even uh, my friend, Rangarajan also. Look, I am not a genetist. For me, genetics means the more lipid is there, less lipid is there. That is called genetics. Other way is called, that is called a phenotype. That's the way I define. Because I don't understand other than this part. Okay? That way we got enough money as a form of a patent and technology was transferred and my life becomes a little better and borrowing has come down. That way, thanks to all my friends who have generously donated to make this discovery to happen. Now we ask a question, if it is there in this yeast, I cannot do a lot of genetics, but I can do a little bit of genetics with the people who are in the department, they work on saccharomyces service here. Can I take help and do some of the genetics? First thing we need to identify, the pathway which I have found in these rhodotrial glutinous, does it exist in this system, is the question which we asked, and then we found a variation in the pathway which is being given here. What is known in the system, in the entire biosynthesis of lipids, is the monocell glycerol is never implicated as a part of an intermediate in any of the biosynthetic process, except in your digestion process. But what we show here is monocell glycerol is an intermediate. There are enzymes which are there. We have isolated. We are a classical protein guys. We purify proteins, and then we sequence protein, clone the genes, put it into yeast, and finally say, yes, the gene, what we have isolated, is real, which I didn't tell you. The classical biochemistry used to do from that time. Now, we have showed it on the yeast. <coughs> I have not given any publication. You can just Google and find out whatever you need. OK? That way, don't worry about the list. Then the next question we asked, because I'll be fascinated with the plant for one reason, because I'm a farmer, I told you. I grow plants. I know naturally I know how to grow plants. I never been to any agriculture university to study. But <laughs> by birth I learned. That is another model system we asked. Can I take the entire assembly which we talked about it in these yeast? Can I have the similar thing in plant? Yes, we found. There also we found there is a new pathway which we have come. It's a new alternative pathway where instead of where you always see phosphoretic acid as an intermediate, here, what you see here is monocell glycerol as an intermediate to create this. The variation here is very simple. What is this variation got to do with my life? That variation creates new genes. When the new genes comes, you can get a new patent. When the new patent comes, my lab is growing. Remember, that's all it is. We have done this, and we are the first one to really show there's a new type of acyl transferase called DG83, and you can see it. This pathway is a legendary pathway. People call it as an Indian pathway, or some people who knows me, they call me as a Ram pathway. At least that credit goes to my department. And every of my colleagues, they criticize my research so much to improve my research. And that's the way I really look at it. Thanks to all of you for this kind of a credit. Which, And then what did they do? There is a company who came in. They said it's a beautiful called CTAC technology. What is that CTAC? Cytosolic triacyl glycerol bisynthetic machinery can be used. And then they took this gene. Because already I sold the gene of the earlier part of rhodotrella glutinous. This company says, we will give me just a right. I will give you a grant to really do. They took the gene and put it into a plant and showed there is an increase in oil. It is not my part of the data, but they paid enough money to run my research. Then we asked, I'm so ambitious. And I said, oh, can I prove the same point in the human system? But unfortunately, we failed. But only one gene was identified. It happened to be that gene has a lysophosphoretic acid acyl transferase activity. But later we found that gene is associated with one of these uh, syndrome called Shannon Endowment syndrome. I have nothing to do with that disease. I have nothing to do with the disease. What I am trying to say, I am trying to look for a soluble triacyl glycerol biosynthetic machinery. I stumbled upon a gene. That gene is a soluble in nature, but it does catalyze some of these reactions. Okay? That we have still yet to find the entire pathway in human.
Now we see, as, as a, I can tell you, now I have a little more time. My friend, uh, Rangarajan and myself go for a walk. He talks about transcription factor, transcription factor. I talk about metabolism and metabolism. And he has managed to convert me, transform me from a classical metabolism person to a transcription factor person. When we ask the question, what does it pull? The reactions which I have given is actually you are pulling and pushing these reactions, thereby you get more and more of these oils. That's the one which we have studied. He said that is not good enough. The company has done this trial on the plant. It showed not a great increase, not more than 1.1 to 1.5 percent of the oil increase, but it's a huge increase. Remember, when you calculate, 1 percent oil means just calculate back in per seed. It is so high in terms of last part. Okay. Now, because of his constant, he says, maybe a master is there. The master tells you where the carbon has to go. The traffic policeman I have to find to send the signal which direction. And Finally, I got into a, a transcription factor, and then I have decided to work on only the pathway which we have found. You know why? That way I can add more information of what we know, the more citations will come. For that reason, we spend more time on the pathway we decoded, and then we have, we have identified many different transcription factors which are actually controls this, but the answer is, can you tell me one transcription factor it does this master's job? We don't know. I don't know at this time. But still, this research I am continuing. The credit goes to this department where these, a yeah, metabolic person has become a transcription factor person. But none of the RNA guys, the transcription guys, accept I do this research, even though I published a beautiful paper, not one to many of them. Now, let me see. What is so different and unique about my department? They let you be what you are. We can talk about printing papers and this and that. I say, I print patents, do. Which department has that kind of a tenacity to say, yes, there is a variation, there is a mutation in our faculty, let the mutation grow. It is me. The first patent has come, many patent has come. We talked about going to an industry, getting a fund. I call this as an, an academic freedom. None of my colleagues during my entire term of 20 years they actually fought to improve my research, but they have been helping, which they didn't know. Today, I came here specifically to tell you, you have been awesome, to find things which can go to textbook. And it is new things at that time, bringing money, taking for a grant, you go to an industry, file a patent, sell patent, make money, not for me, for the lab. This is also new, that is being also appreciated at that time by my colleagues. And before I conclude, I wanted to really show you. And after all these times, when we do patents and do, we will transfer a technology. The company may translate it, may not translate it. Then later we realize an Indian company believe only one thing. I will tell you, Indian company believes you have to give a product. They put it in a pocket and go and sell it to you. It means to say, no more proof is required. The proof has to be translated in a tangible product. Then only the Indian company takes it up. They can talk, but that's the actual reality. That way, when during, after retirement from CSIR, then I had one year time, then they create a company called Nutriome. And we have got some funding from BIRAC and also the Ministry of Food Processing. And that's been going on. And now. Let me thank my whole department wholeheartedly. It is a great opportunity. And after retirement, I thank, but it is the time. The 100 years I have been a part on this journey of at least 20%. 20, year, 20 years I spent time. And I look at it, I still remember Professor Sastri to introduce me to the, the field of lipid. And he still feels proud that the only lipid guy left because all other change their field when they moved from one from here to somewhere else as a postdoc. Nobody continued. And I, I continued. I came back here, I continued in Lipid. And this is the one area with I think at least three to four generations has worked on Lipid. It's a time my old department should consider bringing a modern lipidologist into our department. It's a one of the beautiful discipline to really look at it. Okay. I'm just a request to you all of you. The last part, this is the funding is generous from both corporates and also from this. And I was very fortunate. And the institute pays me enough consultancy fee. That way I can manage to drive cars which are 
different than the rest of the scientists in this nation. I can tell you. Let me thank. You all allowed me to be what I am. For that, I have to thank you all. Thank you all for your time. Raj, for that emotional lecture. One question. I'm the last speaker. If you want to go home early, don't ask questions. We sold. They sold it to others. You want to hear the full story. Yeah. You sell your, your technology to somebody and that they pay so little money and take it out and they take that and go to some other company and sell it and they don't tell you. I don't want to name the company. Mm. Okay, thank you very much uh, Raj. This session uh, is now closed and on behalf of my co-chair, I thank uh, everybody for the wonderful uh, uh, interaction. And now uh, you can uh, talk about the dinner. <laughs> he can. So on behalf of speakers for sharing their memories about their time in IISC, we hope the talks we have heard today will inspire us to strive for excellence in the years to come. We would also like to thank all our colleagues for attending the centenary celebrations and the volunteers for the efforts in making it a successful event. Finally, thank you all for coming and making this program a success.